Glenn and I want to welcome you to Biz 2020. We're excited that so many of you are joining us remotely. I think this is the biggest Biz ever, but Valerio, I'll let you get to that in a few moments. Knowing that to try to keep your attention in the virtual world that we need to be creative, we've decided to make this opening session a little different this year. We're gonna do an interview style. We were scheduled to be here in Salt Lake City for Biz this week. Valerio, do you wanna say a few words about Salt Lake City? Well, yeah, I'm glad to welcome everybody to Salt Lake City, although virtually. And uh, here are a few images of our city. As you can see, this is a place where uh, people enjoy the great outdoors while dinosaurs still remain inside. Our host institution is the University of Utah. Do you want to say something about the U? Yeah, so the university put a lot of effort in helping us uh, setting up this uh, conference. And here you can see the many faces of our community and how they rise up to the occasion and uh, really uh, creating the space where uh, we can have a great uh, virtual conference. Okay, we're now to the point to talk about the numbers. Valerio, how do things look? So this is really exciting. Uh, despite all the difficulties, uh, we actually now at the record numbers, uh, more than double the previous record year. So we already have uh, 2,900 plus uh, attendees registered for the conference and counting. Uh, this is definitely the biggest uh, this conference um, we ever had. Uh, we have uh, attendees from 80 different countries and this is also doubling the previous uh, uh, record of 40 countries or so. And here in the map, you can see the distribution of people attending from different locations. Thanks for those encouraging numbers. As you can imagine, something of this size and magnitude cannot happen without many, many hands. I want to say that the organizing committee has done an awesome job this year. Everyone, yes, everyone went above and beyond to make this a great event. Valerio, can you introduce the committee? Uh, it's a true pleasure to introduce our organizing committee. Uh, we have over 100 people involved this year in the organization. Um, we had to increase the number of people uh, participating because uh, we really needed to help each other in, in, in the face of the challenges of COVID-19. In particular, I would like to highlight that we have introduced two new committees, one um, providing feedback on the organization of the virtual conference, the virtual biz committee, and one is the technical committee that is dealing with all the challenges of streaming the talks live and organizing chats and so on to make the uh, virtual conference still a lively event where everybody can participate. Thanks, Valero. You know, one frequently asked question we get is, who's core? They keep asking things like, why do they keep CCing core on these things? Larry, who is this group? Uh, so uh, in core, uh, we have a small group of people that are highly committed. We, throughout the year, we met uh, every single week. And uh, this involved the uh, back chair, the IEEE connection, uh, archive chairs, finance chairs, and program chair. And here you can see the faces of the people that kind of were the most committed to the success to this conference. I want to also express my thanks to CORE. This conference has been a great success in large part due to them. Being a fully virtual conference, there were many worries early on that our supporters would just bail on us. However, if I understand it correctly, our supporters really did step up. Valerio, can you highlight the supporters? Yes, it's a pleasure to report that despite the concerns, uh, both in terms of organization and financial strain uh, of COVID-19, the support that really showed up and uh, gave us the ability to move forward with a strong uh, conference this year. And we have uh, support at all levels, starting from platinum supporters, which will give also um, plenary keynotes, uh, bronze supporters, parallel supporters, and several uh, diversity and inclusivity scholarship 
that really make sure that our community can participate. In addition, we have uh, three new TAVO supporters, technology sponsors, that really help us on the, uh, all the aspects of the virtual conference, from streaming live to having a new virtual website and a new advanced uh, registration system. We really appreciate all of our sponsors. Given that this is the first ever IEEE Biz virtual conference, I know that we were worried about making this a great experience for all. In light of that, what's new at Biz this year? So this year, it's really a year of uh, new things that we're starting and experimenting with. Hopefully everybody will enjoy those novelties. Uh, obviously, the first time a virtual conference, this will include uh, a new way of accessing the content through our virtual website. Uh, for the first time in the history of our conference, we'll have a keynote talk given by a Nobel Prize winner, a geneticist uh, that is based here in Utah, Mario Capicchi. Uh, we have uh, two industrial keynotes. Uh, we're going to have uh, electronic posters available online that will probably make, keep available even after the conference is completed. There will be free access for all the attendees, and that really is helping um, broadening the participation to our community. Uh, free access to all the materials during the conference. Uh, so not only you will be able to see the talks, uh, you will have access to all the papers with all the details. And then a new approach to inclusivity to take care of the different needs uh, for people attending. Uh, in a virtual setting. And last and not least, uh, we have a, a restricted uh, range of time for our content, so we will have up to eight parallel sessions, but we will do it proposing a schedule that will be more accessible for more people around the world. It's been a rough year for everyone, but we wanted to acknowledge a few of our colleagues whom we lost this year. Lero, how are we handling that? Yeah, unfortunately, as happens uh, every year, that we lost a few uh, major people in our community. And uh, we will have memorial sessions for Alfred Eisenberg, Bill Lawrenson, and Lucy Noel. This will happen on Tuesday at 2 p.m. Uh, uh, Mountain Time, our time zone. Great. Maybe now you can go into what Virtual Viz 2020 will actually look like this year. Uh, so, uh, as a big shift, uh, uh, our conference will be based much more on the web presence and a new web experience. And so, in addition to the traditional uh, website that has been updated for this year, we have an entirely new virtual uh, website at virtual.ieevs.org, and that will contain a lot of content all the previews of the papers and direct connections to the stream for every presentation. So please make sure that to connect to that website, even all the free attendees will have access to that. And we all have a really oh, a huge thanks to the web committee and the tech committee uh, to make this happen. In our emails to the community, we've emphasized diversity and inclusivity. We want to talk about some of those specific efforts we've been making this year. Given that people are attending biz from their homes, which for many are full of bustling children and other things, are there particular things we're doing to help out attendees? So yes, uh, the diversity and inclusivity committee <coughs> highlighted here really adapted their approach uh, given the transition from a conference on site uh, in an hotel or a convention center to uh, being something done at home. Uh, so we have uh, provided, uh, or they have provided, scholarship uh, for people that needed to register and needed additional funds. This is for the shift uh, in our uh, model, the financial model. And this uh, from different locations and different ethnicities. And uh, for these uh, kids, so instead of the traditional uh, uh, center that we have, we would have in the hotel. We provided some uh, financial support for people that have kids at home 
that would not make it possible for them to participate to the virtual conference. It's very important for the health of our community to maintain a respectful environment. This is possibly even more pressing given that although we are virtually together, we are physically separated. What does that look like in the virtual world, Valera? Well, this year we have updated our code of conduct to uh, take into account the special challenges of having a conference uh, developed in a virtual world. Uh, still, we remain committed to have an environment that is inclusive, harassment free, and so very respectful for people from any uh, background. And uh, in particular, uh, we have uh, a new code of conduct and we invite people to actually look at that on our website. We'll definitely not tolerate any harassment in any form. Um, we have a, a group of people on bus that are uh, connecting uh, directly our community to the leadership uh, of the bank and IEEE and they are safe people to talk to if any uh, difficult situation arises. Here is a list of names that people can talk to and also we have emails uh, for people that have any requests that they will do. We will deal with that in a very um, confidential and um, quick way. How are we engaging applications this year? Uh, so this year also we have a, a <coughs> program that's specifically dedicated to connecting to the applications. This is an area of growth that we see for the conference to connect the basic research to uh, partic practitioners in the community. Uh, we have four sessions um, devoted to different areas. Uh, in particular, we're looking at the challenges in uh, visualization of bioelectric fields, uh, challenges in medical visualization, cosmology visualization, and uh, generally uh, the role of visualization in industrial production. Are there any closing comments you want to make before we uh, have a few words from Vec and then head into the award section of our program? Yeah, I, I mostly I would like to thank uh, everybody in the organization. This year has been amazing to see everybody rise up to the occasion. But most of all, I would like really to thank you guys that are attending the conference. It's really amazing to see the level of participation and support we have received this year with this record number of participants. And we look forward to provide the best uh, possible program um, that we're able to through a virtual setting. And now we'll give it to Vec for a few words and updates for our community. Hello, my name is Lisa Avila and I'm chair of the VIZ Executive Committee, also known as the VEC. The purpose of the VEC is to set conference policy that spans years to pre-approve the associated events and to evaluate and select future conference bids. Historically, the VEC has been composed of two members from each of the vast InfoViz and SciViz steering committees, as well as five select members of the VGTC and a chair. Coming into this conference year, which started at the close of Viz 2019, the VEC consisted of these members. You may notice that I'm using the past tense and terms like historically, and that's because over the past year, we've been implementing the restructuring recommendations crafted by the revised committee. Based on community feedback, it was determined that the best path forward for our conference was to eliminate the separate tracks and unite as one VIZ conference. This resulted in some revisions to the VEC, as well as the creation of the VIZ steering committee known as the VSC. A large part of the VEC's work over the past year was dedicated to this restructuring process. The new VEC is still focused on operational aspects of the conference, with the VSC focused on scientific content. The VEC will be composed of four members that are appointed by the VEC itself, two members that are appointed by the VSC, one member that's appointed by the VGTC chair, and four members that are elected by the community. We're thrilled to be holding the first election for a VEC member next year, with one VEC member elected by the community each year moving forward. Keep an eye out on the usual VIZ communication channels for more information about the process. 
The VEC is seeking proposals for pre-approved events for VIZ 2021 and bids for hosting future conferences in 2023 and beyond. As you likely already know, VIZ 2021 will be hosted out of New Orleans, and we're excited to announce that VIZ 2022 will be in Melbourne, Australia. You can send those proposals and bids, or any questions you may have, to VEC at IEEEViz.org. Thank you for your time, and I hope you enjoy the conference. My name is James Ahrens, and I am the Visualization and Graphics Technical Committee Chair. On behalf of the entire Visualization and Graphics Technical Committee, I'd like to welcome you to VIZ 2020. The Visualization and Graphics Technical Committee has a mission to manage, support, and provide oversight for all IEEE visualization and VR conferences. This includes the bag flagship visualization and VR conferences, as well as conferences on augmented and mixed reality, large data, biological data, and visualization and computer graphics in a regional setting in the Pacific. VGTC supports cross-conference initiatives. That is, members of the VGTC have a specialty, such as uh, publications or um, industrial relations. They work with the conferences to understand their practices, bring best practices back to the VGTC, and then work to disseminate them out to all conferences. VGTC also has a set of initiatives that are very important to the community. They include a diversity initiative, online services, and open access. VGTC provides financial support for these activities. We also support exchanges with other conferences, including the ACM and Eurographics. It's been an exciting and challenging year for VGTC. We transitioned the conferences to virtual. Um, having IEEE as our sponsor was invaluable. They were able to help us negotiate um, with conference centers and hotels away from in-person events. Um, we also supported the IEEE VIZ conference as it merged together three conferences, VAST, InfoViz, and SciViz. This conference, th sorry, this merger is ongoing. You'll see positive changes this year, and these changes will be fully implemented next year. We've outreached to the VR and AR conference communities we're stronger together. Uh, in the past, VIZ has uh, dominated the VGTC community and we're working to balance the, across VR and visualization. I'd like to highlight a success of, of VGTC that is diversity scholarships. We've given thousands of dollars in diversity scholarships this year. Um, they're available to all VGTC conferences and we have more people attending our conferences now and we're, we're better as a diverse community and inclusive community. Um, our new VGTC board members, I'd like to welcome them aboard. Um, some of them you may know. If you do know them, please text them and offer them congratulations. Some of them you don't, they're probably from the VR community. Ideally, you'll get to know them. I also encourage you to reach out to your VGTC board members, any ones that you know, and tell us your thoughts on uh, what, what would be helpful for the visualization and graphics community. Finally, I'd like to highlight some improvements to the VGTC award process. Um, we established specific duties for the VIZ and VR awards chairs with the goal of diversifying the awards um, applicant pool, and we welcome input from the broad range of community members. We are increasing oversight and transparency to the process. One way we're doing this is by having the uh, awards chairs document the selection criteria for each award. And finally, excitingly, we're expanding the portfolio of VGTC awards to include a new early career award with up to two awardees per year and expanding the technical achievement award to allow two awardees per year. Um, we're also reviving the service award. At this time, I'd like to ask Chuck Hansen to um, present the Viz VGTC award for 2020. Thank you.
Hi, I'm Chuck Hansen. As Jim said, I'm the new Visualization Awards Chair. There are going to be some changes coming in 2021. Uh, as Jim said, there'll be a significant new researcher or early career award. The naming is uh, up in the air at the moment. Uh, there could be up to two per year and increase the technical achievement award count up to two per, per year. And to revive the service award, and the service should include either conference or VGTC service uh, to rec recognize those contributing to the co community. One of the things I want to work towards is transparency of the awards committee, the no nominations, and the awards process. We'd like to include di diversity and inclusiveness uh, and increase nom nom nominations. If you have ideas about how to do this, I'd be glad to hear from you and take it under con consideration. I want to provide consistency on all uh, uh, parts of the awards process, including pu published criteria for the awards, and there'll be more information on the process coming up. So next slide. The first set of awards are the VGTC Dissertation Awards. Klaus, Klaus Mueller chaired this, this this year. The process had 14 submissions with 10 senior committee members from all VIZ areas. Each dissertation had at least three reviews. Five of the most highly rated uh, dissertations were again reviewed by additional uh, members and ranked. And then consensus was reached through, through email. So next slide. The IEEE VGTC Dissertation Award for Best Dissertation goes to Dr. Dominique Moritz from the University of Washington, whose uh, dissertation was titled Interactive Systems for Scalable Visualization and Analysis, advised by Jeff Heer. Next slide. There are also two honorable men mentions, Dr. Emily Wall from Georgia Tech, whose dissertation was titled Detecting and Mitigating Human Bias in Visual Analytics, advised by Alex Ender, and Dr. Carolina Nombre from the University of Utah, whose dissertation was titled Visualizing Multivariate Networks, advised by Alex Lex. So please con con congratulate all of these dissertation award winners um, uh, for their great work, and we look forward to their future contributions. So next slide. Um, the Viz 2020 Awards was, uh, was run by Holly Rush Rushmeyer, and the way that she ran this is there were uh, five voting members, Sheila Carpendale, David Ebert, Tom Ertl, Chris Johnson, Kwan Lu Ma, and Holly as the chair was a non-voting member. The process that they used was uh, open call for no no nominations, then the voting members ranked the nominees and the anonymized rankings and comments were set to, sent to Holly and she uh, anonymized those and distributed them to the voting members. There was discussion and further anonymous votes ranking the uh, not, 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 not nominees. The votes were sent in to the non-voting committee chair and they were treated as anonymous votes. In the final meeting, uh, the uh, anonymous agreement was reached on each of the awardees. So next slide. I'd like to congratulate jean Daniel Fiquette from in INRIA for the IEEE VGTC Visualization Technical Achievement Award of 2020. In recognition of his research innovations in network visualization, visual analytics infrastructure, and data physicalization, jean Daniel has a few words to say. Good morning, everyone. It's a great honor to receive the IEEE VIZ Technical Achievement Award. VIZ is my community since 2001, and I see people from this community as friends as much as colleagues. So being awarded feels both as a professional recognition and a greeting from friends. I thank you all for this recognition. Of course, I have to acknowledge the amazing students and colleagues that I have worked with to deserve this award. I owe this award to them much more than to myself. I also owe it to something we often forget, chance. Many of the students and postdocs came by pure chance. I did not search for them, they just appeared at the right moment by chance. So 
As Robert Frank highlighted, I want to also acknowledge Chance for helping me so much. This technical award relates to my main research themes. I have worked on toolkits and software infrastructure when it was difficult to program visualization systems. Now, many toolkits and tools are available, so this is no longer a hot research topic. I have also worked and keep on working in network visualization that remain a difficult and very interesting topic. And more recently, I became interested in progressive data analysis and visualization. So at the beginning, there was a nodeling diagram. Before the year 2000, it was the only visual representation used for graphs, almost. With Mohamed Goniem, PhD student then, we showed that adjacency matrices were more effective for dense networks and for some important tasks, but not all. That study has been a surprise for the graph visualization community. We then continue to investigate alternative visual representation for networks with Nathalie Henri Rich, PhD student at the time. She designed several hybrid and coordinated visual representation of networks, very appealing and effective. She continues to create nice alternative visual representation of networks to better support exploration in various contexts. Then with Anastasia Bezerianos and colleagues, we introduced graph dice to visualize networks with vertex measures using a rolling dice metaphor and genea quilts to visualize large genealogies in a readable fashion, still in use by anthropologists and historians. Then with Benjamin Bach and colleagues, we worked on dynamic networks, in particular with matrices stacked over time. And more recently with Paola Valdivia and many other colleagues, we have introduced the PAUVIS visual representation very re readable, inspired by Biofabric, to visualize mid-sized dynamic hypergraphs. And we continue to work along that line with higher level operations, such as clustering. So the topic remains very important to facilitate the exploration of dynamic and multivariate networks that are able to model so many real-world phenomena. And even after 20 years, I still find the topic fun, and so stay tuned. More recently, since 2016, I've been fascinated by progressive data analysis and visualization as a means to achieve scalability in visual analytics. Stolper and Perer call it also progressive visual analytics. The topic is very important to deal with the larger amount of data and the novel powerful algorithms available. Exploration requires interfaces with fast response time, but the traditional, traditional synchronous programming cannot limit this latency. So this new paradigm requires a lot of research, sometimes hard, but the goals are worth it. And I happen to like addressing all of this challenge a lot. So this is my call to join this line of research, which will need more research and engineering in the forthcoming years. And, and this is my prediction, will certainly become a major field of research and application in the next 10 years. Finally, I want to thank all of my VIS colleagues and the VGTC Award Committee for supporting me. INRIA, my institution, has provided me a great working environment and a lot of freedom during all these years. And of course, all of my close colleagues who have been inspiring me and challenging me, but also supporting me all this time. Thank you all. It gives me great pleasure to announce the 2020 IEEE VGTC Visualization Career Award, which goes to Catherine Plaisant from the University of Maryland in recognition of her comprehensive body of work within the field of data visualization, including her contributions to evaluation, benchmarks, case studies, and her specific research focus on event sequence visualization. Catherine would like to say a few words now. Hello, everyone. 
I am so incredibly honored to receive this award. I thank the award committee, the people who nominated me, everyone who organized the conference. Thank you. For those who don't know me, I grew up in France. I went to an industrial engineering school. And for my PhD, I designed a system that was using speech input to activate devices around the house for people who had lost all mobility. I worked in Paris for a few years, and then my partner at the time convinced me to move to the US, and I got a job at the University of Maryland. The unique multidisciplinary community of the Human Computer Interaction Lab has been my home since then. I am forever grateful to Ben Schneiderman for having been my mentor early on and to for being the best research partner one can imagine for more than 30 years. A few landmarks. My first job at HCIL was to work on Hypertize, an early hypertext system. Then the focus switched to novel touchscreen interaction. Sometime your smallest work gets the most attention. This 1991 video was central as prior art in the slide to unlock patent court decision. Then the work on information visualization exploded. I focused on demonstrating the benefits of visualization in real applications, such as dynamic maps for the National Center for Health Statistics or query preview to search NASA data sets, which was the inspiration for now, the now ubiquitous faceted search. We designed many, many other novel techniques and choosing some to describe feel like favoring some of your children. Working with real users and real data has been the major thread in the work of Maryland. Let's pick the example of event sequence visualization. In 1996, we observed caseworkers of the Maryland Department of Juvenile Justice handling piles of screens like this. So we designed lifelines to summarize the record of individual juvenile offenders. And we could quantify benefits very clearly. Soon after, we worked with IBM and Kaiser Permanente to redesign lifelines to show the records of individual patients. That can be traced to current applications. 10 years later, we were challenged by folks at the Washington Hospital Center to look at collections of medical records, leading to lifeline two, then life flow, and event flow to summarize the records and search for complex temporal patterns. Then observing army pharmacovigilance officer trying to manually compare patterns in two cohorts of patients inspired us to find new approaches with COCO. Finally, our last PhD student, Fendu, worked on prescriptive analytics. Because insight is great, but confidence about what to do next is what we crave for. It is very clear to me that working closely with real users and their real data has been a powerful motor of innovation for a talented PhD student to do magic. The work of our users is often complex, leading to a hunt for fresh ways to do evaluation. One of the landmarks was the first information visualization contest organized in 2004 with Jean Daniel and George Greenstein. Then, after Jim Thomas' agenda for visual analytic was published, the contest evolved into the vast challenge we launched in 2006 with George and colleagues at PNNL to provide realistic intelligence problems for the vast community to solve. The First Believe workshop offered an, another venue for discussions of evaluation of visualization techniques. It's still a challenge today, so go see the workshop as it continues at VIS every two years. To finish, I'll mention our Isonic project because I'm proud that we try to address the issue of users with vision impairments. It is possible to do it, and I hope our community will do more of that so that no one is left out of important information such as this. I hope to see you in New Orleans in person next year or in Paris whenever I can go back and do a three months visit at Inria. A big thanks to the conference and to all the students and collaborators who have made hard work more rewarding and life more fun. Thank you.
So to wrap up the awards, I'd like to uh, talk about the IEEE Visualization Academy. As you might recall, it was established by the BGTC Executive Committee in 2018. And the Academy is a Visualization Technology Hall of Fame. It's a prestigious honorary academy of leaders in the field uh, and highlights the accomplishments of these leaders of visualization and indirectly underscore the accomplishment of the entire field. The Academy Selection Committee was chaired by Ari Kaufman and composed of committee members Sheila Carpendale, Jian Chen, Yark Benwick, and Anna Villanova. The process, there was a call for nom nominations. They received 33. The committee ranked their uh, top uh, 10 in the first round voted for seven inductees to the academy. The second round discussed the uh, re 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 remaining uh, nom nominees and they were of such high caliber, they decided to induct eight additional uh, members for a total of 15. Next slide. So this year, the 2020 Visualization Academy inductees include Leila de Floriani, Jean-Daniel Paquette, Jesse Kennedy, Fang Shen Li, Shijia Liu, Sylvia Milch, Catherine Plaisant, Wa Min Chu, Penny Reingens, Heidi Schumann, Hanwei Shen, Deborah Silver, Robert Spence, Maureen Stone, and Colin Ware. So, Let's congratulate all of these new Academy mem members and thank you for your uh, time. And I look forward to hearing from many of you in the future. Welcome to the 2020 VIZ Test of Time Awards. I'm Stephen North from the VIZ Conference Steering Committee. I would like to say a few words about what the awards mean to our community. 2020 is the last year of having separate conferences for Visual Analytics, InfoViz, and SciViz. Next year, these conferences will be combined in one technical program. Of course, our goal is to keep what is already very successful about VIZ and to build upon the best of it. So this is a great time to reflect on how the field has progressed and to recognize and appreciate some of the best studies presented in the past. The work we're honoring today meets the test of time criterion because of its impact on the entire field and its benefit to everyone who needs to see and understand data. As a result of such work, visualization plays a central role in data analysis and communication across many fields in the sciences, engineering, medicine, business, and the humanities. The test of time papers each, in some way, contributed to our fundamental understanding of visualization and visual communication, or they describe methods, algorithms, systems, techniques, and other inventions that make visualization work in the real world. That exemplifies the purpose of this entire conference. These awards are being made for the papers that were selected by the award committees, but the success of that work depended on the efforts of a much larger community. So we want to also gratefully acknowledge the thousands of hours of work behind the scenes done by colleagues on program committees, reviewers, and by those who manage the operation of this conference, some of them doing this for many years. Now also a few words about how the awards are judged. Not surprisingly, because this is VIZ, the decision is somewhat data-driven, but done under the guidance of human domain experts. Citations are definitely important because they say something specific about the impact of the work over a long period. But there's more to the decision than just counting citations. We considered the significance of the ideas, how they moved the field forward, set an example of the quality of work we're striving to reach. 
Some papers inspired other work by opening up new lines of thinking or new areas of research, or they made groundbreaking connections to other fields. So as you watch this session, please take a moment to reflect on the scope, intellectual depth, and impact of these studies. Let's get to the awards. We have five awards, which are for the three conferences in VIZ, and looking back over various time spans depending on the conference and when it was started. First, we'll have the VAST Tenure Test of Time Award to be presented by Giuseppe Santucci. Then, the InfoViz 20-Year and 10-Year Test of Time Awards to be presented by Catherine Plazant. And the SciViz 25-Year and 15-Year Test of Time Awards that will be presented by Terry Yu. So now I would like to introduce Giuseppe Santucci who will present the Test of Time Award in Visual Analytics, Science and Technology, or VAST. First of all, I would like to say good morning to everyone, or better, because I am not aware of the time zones of connected people. I would like to say good after morning to everyone. I am Giuseppe Santucci, the chair of the vast test of time committee. And I'm going to briefly present the work of the committee and to announce the winner. 2010 was very important for VAST. In that year, it was for the first time a, an official conference. And the award panel composed by Rem Chang, Bayan Fischer and myself had a very hard task to do. We had to select the winner among 26 good papers. And here, there is a brief description of the procedure. We initially selected the five papers on the top of the citation because uh, the drop in citation between the fifth and the sixth was really significant. And after that, we had some analysis about the citation trend in the last 10 years. And uh, eventually we, go, we got the content of the paper and uh, we started the polite discussion within the committee about uh, the paper of vastness, classic or not classic visionetic paper and about the impact on different fields. It was solid and inspiring or it was solid but not inspiring. And uh, we look at the, to the last year of the citations and uh, a lot of, uh, I like it, we like it, you like it, I don't like it, and, and so on. And more, more, more. And eventually, mixing uh, all this stuff uh, till a solid consensus has been reached. And the winner is high-vis classifier, an interactive visual analytic system for classification based on supervised dimension reduction by Jacob Q, Hans Angley, Jacob Kim, and Sun Park from Georgia Tech Institute. And uh, looking at the rationale of the award, you can extract three main points. The paper pioneered the area of the interactively supporting machine learning activities. The paper dealt with the challenging task of allowing the user to explore the result space, and it influenced the subsequent research in practical activities. And having said that, I shut down and I leave the floor to the authors. Congratulations and start the video, please. Hello, I'm Heyson Park from the School of Computational Science and Engineering, Georgia Institute of Technology. My co-authors and I would like to thank the award committee and the VIZ community for this honor of test of the time award. The work was produced while I was directing the FODAVA lead project, FODAVA stands for Foundations of Data and Visual Analytics, which was jointly funded by the National Science Foundation and the Department of Homeland Security. I would like to thank late Jim Thomas, Barry Rosenblum, and Joe Kielman for their vision for creating the FODAVA program. I want to emphasize the importance of mentorship and collaborators, especially when you are getting into a new area or a multidisciplinary area. For this, I'd like to thank Jim Foley for being there as my mentor 
and collaborator John Stesco, from whom I learned much about visualization. Our initial efforts were focused around developing visual analytics for the first step of data exploration to help generate the right questions. Then we realized that even for relatively well-defined tasks like classification, what a completely automated algorithm can offer is very limited, especially when it comes to real applications. That motivated us to work on IB's classifier, a visual analytics system for the classification task. The first challenge was to represent a high dimensional large data set on the limited screen space through severe dimension reduction, preserving the key information. The PCA has been the prevalent method for dimension reduction. However, depending on the problem at hand, it may not produce the best solution. So we developed a supervised dimension reduction method based on the linear discriminant analysis to visualize the cluster data and embedding space that the classifier has learned in the form of 2D scatter plot as well as parallel coordinates. Using IV's classifier, we were able to identify the classes that are difficult to differentiate from each other and outline data items of significantly low quality that should be removed. IV's classifier also visualizes learned features by the classifier to discriminate the given classes. For example, the forehead part for facial recognition as shown in the top left part of the slide. The key techniques proposed in IV's classifier have a lot in common with recent research towards interpretable machine learning and deep learning. For example, our 2D representation visualizes the embedded space of a particular layer of a model and highlighted the parts of an input image or features responsible for the prediction. We try to achieve tight integration among algorithm design, visualization, and user interaction in IV's classifier by co-designing these components from the beginning. This is in contrast to adopting the best existing automated algorithm and then developing visual analytics system on top as an afterthought. This paradigm can be applied to many visual analytics system development. The conceptual advantages of the co-design are recognized, but there still remain many challenges, including the ways to implement the co-design. Some other important issues include justification and explainability. I also believe that bidirectional guidance between automated algorithms and humans' visual interaction is a key research direction for visual analytics to make practical impact on modern artificial intelligence for the real world applications. Thank you. Thank you, Eston, for your insights. And thank you, Beppe, for introducing the VAST award. Next, we move to InfoViz. I'm Catherine Plaisant from the University of Maryland, and I chair the selection panels for the two Test of Time awards looking at InfoViz 2000 and 2010. 20 years ago, InfoViz was in Salt Lake City, still a small symposium opposed to a conference and with 20 papers. Peter Eisenberg, Jean-Daniel Fekett, Peng Ching Li, and Joe Wood helped me with the selection. And the winners are Chris Dalty, Diane Tang, and Pan Anraha for Polaris, a system for query, analysis, and visualization of multidimensional relational databases. As was common at the time, the symposium paper was followed shortly after by a longer TVCG paper which was later reprinted in CACM in 2008 as an ACM technical highlight, further broadening the paper's already wide audience. Together, those papers have been highly cited and continue to be cited regularly. But clearly, the most visible impact of this work is that it became the core of Tableau, the very successful information visualization product most of you know and use. Word of praise included a declarative visual query language that unifies the strengths of visualization and database communities. 
or this excellent academic work showed that academic research can reach out to a very broad audience, extremely original work, and an invitation to think out of the box. Let's hear Chris Dolty reflect, reflect on the paper. Hi, I'm Chris Dolty, one of the co-authors on this paper and a co-founder of Tableau. On behalf of Pat and Diane, we are honored by this award. Let me take you back in time. This paper was written in the late 1990s. The visualization group at Stanford had just gotten started and we were still trying to figure out the best ways to contribute and make progress. We'd spent many of those early years solving real world problems using visualization. Things like understanding mobile phone usage patterns or memory utilization or operating system simulation data. This experience helped us to understand the challenges of applying visualization to real data and real problems. Now, each time we tried to solve one of these problems, we noticed something. Once people saw the visualization that we built to answer a specific question, it led to additional questions that the user wanted to answer. And then we'd have to build a new system. As this kept repeating, we realized we needed to make the process of building a visualization to answer a question something that the user could do themselves as they engaged in a cycle of visual analysis. The key here was the real world experience of iterating and answering questions. This experience deeply informed the work in this paper and it helped us to understand the importance of building systems where users can themselves constantly change both the data they're looking at and how they're looking at it. Now, at the same time that we were grappling with this problem, we were chatting with Jim Gray, who encouraged us to examine how people in industry and corporate environments were answering questions from data. In particular, he guided us to look at both the traditional relational databases, where most of the data that people had questions about was stored, as well as Excel, to understand why that was the interface to data for many people and to try and do better. Now this resulted in our focus on a formalism that unified visualization and database queries, and we owe Jim a debt of gratitude. Now looking back, we suspect it's the deep practicality of understanding and focusing on facilitating analytical iteration while working within the context of how people conduct analysis in the real world all of that based on the experience of concrete problems, we feel like that's likely driven the longevity of this work. Now, all three of us have continued in this area, Pat and myself at Tableau and Diane at Google, working on insights from data and the accompanying infrastructure. And this remains an exciting and challenging area to work in. Many of the questions about data that should be easy to answer, they're still too hard. Not just the PhD level questions, but the common questions that jump to mind when someone sees a visualization. They're still just too hard. Now at the same time, data is no longer just in relational format. The database world has become much richer and varied. How can visualization systems more deeply integrate with all of these data systems? And finally, how can all of this be made faster? Those are the examples of challenges that keep all three of us focused on this work. Thank you, Chris. Staying with the year 2000 for a minute, I want to mention that there will be an homage to Lucy Norwell today at two. I mention it because we will always remember Lucy as the co-author of the Theme River paper, an extremely popular design, also now called StreamGraph. This is another good example of paper you should check out when thinking about the type of impact you want to have when writing your next InfoViz paper. But let's move to 2010. 10 years ago, Viz was also in Salt Lake City. InfoViz was now a full conference with 35 papers. Miraya Mayer and Joe Wood helped me with the selection. So for 2010, the winners are Edward Siegel and Jeffrey Ayer with a paper, Narrative Visualization, Telling Stories with Data. 
first for the paper included, it structured the concept of narrative storytelling. It launched a new theme of research at InfoViz, and it remains vibrant today. We found a lot of important follow-up work at Viz and elsewhere. The InfoViz paper was widely credited for this research of uh, direction of research as demonstrated with the more than 900 citations. So let's now hear from Edward and then Jeff as they reflect on their experience and the work ahead. Thank you. I came to academia after a number of years working in finance where you use charts and graphs really for the language of analysis. Um, and I always found myself paying as much attention to how we presented data as what the data actually said about markets. So I guess it's with that practitioner mindset that the emerging world of narrative visualizations first caught my attention. You can go back to 2010 when we were writing this paper. Imagine this was a time before the terms big data and machine learning were even being used. But there were a few interesting things happening that led to this work. Um, first, there were a bunch of new sophisticated web frameworks being introduced and old tools like Flash were being replaced. Second, there was a breed of data journalists doing a lot of experimentation online to stretch what could be done in a browser. And third, um, there were these data viz blogs that were capturing everything that was going on. So, you know, being in academia gives you the time and the charter to step back and reflect on these kinds of trends um, happening in the real world, not just, you know, building on academic papers or paying attention to research labs. And I think, um, you know, ultimately Jeff and I were in the right place at the right time to think that this body of work was worthy of investigation to think about putting structure around this work and ultimately translating it to an academic forum. Uh, so I didn't stay in academia. Um, personally, this paper led directly to work in data viz at media companies. And ultimately I helped start a health insurance company where I ran product using, you know, a lot of these same visualization techniques to inform uh, good design in healthcare. And so I think, you know, starting with this paper, I never would have known uh, the path that would follow. And so for graduate students, you know, wondering what is next, this is a good lesson in the merits of working across disciplines, really acting on your instincts and your natural curiosity, and just taking the next step without worrying too much where it will go. So I'm very honored, surprised, and humbled by this award, and thank you. Thank you for this award. Since Eddie and I published our paper 10 years ago, a lot has changed, but a lot has stayed the same. Narrative visualization remains a central part of data-driven journalism, but its use has evolved. Scrolly telling became dominant and remains with us still. Ongoing experiments have explored new genres, such as data comics, cinematic visualization, and augmented reality, let alone the explosion of graphics, both good and bad, around COVID-19. Meanwhile, the research community has investigated topics such as narrative sequencing, authoring tools for interactive articles, and studies of data literacy. But beyond the overall relevance of storytelling, if anything has stood the test of time, it is our long list of open challenges. We are still seeking a richer understanding of how to design and assess visualizations beyond the familiar confines of perceptual tasks and dedicated analysis work. For narrative use cases, a deeply interdisciplinary approach is needed, likely drawing on other fields such as literature, media studies, and education. I think we also must continue to build richer interconnections between research and practice. Our paper was, at heart, our way of trying to make sense of the incredible creativity and innovation of visualization practitioners to build up a shared vocabulary to help those insights travel further. It was only a small step forward much remains to be done. Our hope is that this award brings further attention and urgency to the work ahead. Thanks. Edward and Jeffrey, thank you for your insights and congratulations again for this year's 10-year InfoViz Test of Time Award. 
Also, thank you to Catherine and Beppe. It's been a pleasure working with both of you on this year's Test of Time Honors. Next, we move to consider this year's SciViz Awards. Unlike InfoViz and VAST, the SciViz Test of Time Awards are for papers published 25 and 15 years ago. I'm Terry Yu, and I chaired the selection for the, this year's two SciViz Awards, one for 1995 and one for 2005. 25 years ago, the IEEE Conference on Visualization was in its sixth year and was held in Atlanta, Georgia. Our young conference was held with panels, case studies, and that year with 41 technical papers. There was a small number of standout papers that we considered for this award. I'm grateful to my federal fellow panelists, Chris Johnson and Penny Reingans, for their input and contributions. The winners of the 25-year Test of Time Award for the Visualization 1995 Conference are Alan Martin and Mar Matthew Ward for their paper, High Dimensional Brushing for Interactive Exploration of Multivariate Data. While the co-authors for this paper did not invent brushing as a means for illuminating multivariate data, they helped bring this concept and its associated term into the visualization lexicon. When considering test of time awards, we usually consider derivative papers. The winner of this year's 25 visualization test of time award is noteworthy because it, it is itself a, a derivative work of a related substantial paper. XMDV tool integrating multiple methods for visualizing multivariate data by Matt Ward from IEEE Visualization 94. Together, these papers were instrumental in bringing brushing to the attention of our community. They have been cited over 880 times and they continue to be cited and downloaded today. In 2014, our community was profoundly saddened by the untimely passing of Matt Ward. He was a stalwart member of the visualization community and a self-proclaimed aspiring curmudgeon. For the panel, Chris Johnson, Penarangans, and I, it is an honor to highlight Matt's work and to have selected high dimensional brushing for interactive exploration of multivariate data. We are extremely grateful to be joined by his co-author and former student, Alan Martin, now of NVIDIA, who will present the paper and receive the award. Hello, everyone. I'm Alan Martin, and I'm honored to accept the IEEE Viz Test of Time Award on behalf of myself and Matt Ward for our 1995 paper, High Dimensional Brushing for Interactive Exploration of Multivariate Data. Matt was my mentor and advisor for this work while I was a graduate student at WPI. And although Matt's no longer with us, visualization was both his passion and his life's work, and I think this award is a fitting tribute to that passion. I remember when I first started working with Matt and I would show up for our advisor meetings, he would insist that we walk around Institute Park next to the WPI campus and have a walking meeting. Now, Worcester is a beautiful place, especially in the autumn, and I always looked forward to these walks. However, I had assumed when the cold Worcester winter started and the snowbanks were as tall as me that the walking meetings would end and perhaps we'd meet over coffee instead. Well, I assumed wrong, and thus I learned my first important life lesson from Matt, which is always bring boots. So I've been thinking about what I can say to inspire young scientists working on visualization research. Now, I no longer work on that myself, but I can share a few relevant ideas from my experience in industry where visualization is being used to solve hard problems. I work at NVIDIA as a functional safety software architect for autonomous vehicles. Now, one of the challenges facing adoption of autonomous vehicle technology is how scary it is for a driver to give over control of the vehicle to a computer system. Part of this distrust lies in the fact that it is difficult to know if the vehicle is aware of its surroundings and if it's making safe choices. I think that visualization of these observations and decisions that the software is making will be an important part of the trust building that's necessary for widespread adoption of the technology. However, this is challenging as there is a large amount of dynamic information and it needs to be displayed in a way that the driver can understand it quickly in order for it to be useful. Another problem related to autonomous vehicles is worst case execution time. So autonomous vehicles are hard real-time systems as both the correctness of a function as well as the time that it takes to 
execute that function are both critical to safety. Calculating worst case execution time of a software component is difficult to prove in these complex systems that are both highly parallel and have a large amount of asynchronous sensor input. But one of the mitigations to solving this problem in the face of the complexity is to take a data-driven approach. And that's based on measurements under different types of system load. This results in large high dimensional data sets that scientific visualization techniques can be used on to explore outliers. In conclusion, I'll share what I think is the most important idea from, that I learned from working on this research. And that's the power of taking complex information and converting it into understanding. Now, I've seen this in my career where a clear, well-designed chart has the potential to change minds and it can make a direct impact on products. I want to thank you all again for the honor of this award. Thank you, Alan. Moving on to 2005. Over the intervening decade, Viz had grown considerably. 15 years ago, Viz was in Minneapolis. Visual analytics had infused new ideas and energy both to the conference and into the fabric of our community. Our field was investing time and energy re-examining our roots and our contribution to science and society. Amidst that reflection, a paper emerged that captured our attention. The 15-year test of time award for the Visualization 2005 conference is The Value of Visualization by Jack Van Vick. This paper concisely makes the argument for the general field of visualization. It was invited and was published the following year as a related journal paper titled Views on Visualization in the IEEE Transaction on Visualization and Computer Graphics. Later, Jack was a co-author on a related influential paper in 2008 titled The Value of Information Visualization. Jack won the Best Paper Award in 2005 for this work. Praise for the value of visualization includes the common observation that it is required reading for many of our undergraduate and graduate classes on our subject. The panelists, Chris Johnson, Penny Rangans, and I are most pleased to have selected this paper for the 15-year Test of Time Award for 2020. Let's hear from Jack Van Vick on his updated views on the value of visualization and congratulate him for winning this year's Test of Time Award. Hello, I'm Jacques van Wijk from Eindhoven University of Technology. First of all, I want to thank the jury for granting me this great award. It's a big honor for me, and a true highlight in my career. The paper is quite special for me. It's the most generic paper I ever wrote, but also it's the most personal one. Let's have a look at the background. Let's go back to 2005. At that time, there was quite a lot of discussion in our field. The great Bill Lorenzen wrote a disturbing paper and we were wondering, are we doing the right things? How about our impact? What should we do? For all of us, these are still important questions, not only in the abstract, but also in daily practice. What problem to attack? How to do that? What to tell your students? To answer questions like that, you have to consider fundamental issues. What is a good visualization? And above all, what's the value of visualization? So I started to reflect. I wanted to be honest and critical. And I decided to dump everything that was on my mind and not to hold back. I expected that such an opinion paper would be rejected immediately for this. And that idea was quite liberating. Later on, I was surprised and delighted that my paper got accepted and even got the Best Paper Award. A few words about the contents. I started by setting up a model for visualization in general. Next, I used that model to calculate the value of visualization. The idea is simple. Let's use a cost-benefit analysis. The benefit of visualization is an increase in knowledge. However, there are also many costs involved all over the place. 
I enumerated all these costs and came up with a formula for the value of visualization. And that led to a conclusion. A great visualization brings a lot of knowledge to many people and minimal costs in terms of time, effort and money. Indeed, very obvious. As an example, I use this model to show that my work on tree maps was much more valuable than my work on Flowvis. Now Sequoia View tool has been downloaded by many people who could easily find out why their hard disks were full and next take action. Well, my work on texture-based flow visualization never really went mainstream. Throughout the paper, I also discuss a variety of related issues. I wanted to dump everything, remember? When I reread the paper, I was happy to find out that we have made a lot of progress since 2005. Concerning visualization as a, gen as a science, many strong overview papers are available now. Methodology has progressed much, and evaluation and validation are now core topics in our field. But to have impact remains a challenge. And it brings me back to the value of visualization. I do not want to claim at all that my paper has the final answers, but I really hope that my paper will continue to stimulate people to reflect on their work in order to provide real value through visualization. Thanks again for this great award.
Hello, everybody. Uh, we're now at a great uh, point. We're going to uh, listen from the recipients of the best paper awards uh, of the various venues of InfoViz, BAST, and SciViz. Uh, in particular, we'll start with the um, best paper uh, for BAST uh, for the paper we titled a visual analytics system to assess understand and improve uh, traffic light detection. Others, Liang Go, uh, Lin Kan Zhu, Nang Xiang Li, Michael Hoffman, Shekhar Kumar, Alex uh, Wen, and Liu Ren. And so I would like to introduce Liang Go. They will give the talk and, uh, and then take questions from the audience. Please, without further ado, please present the paper. Hello everyone, this is Liang Go from Bosch Research. I'm very happy to share our recent work in an exciting domain of autonomous driving, Vadilate, a visual analytic system to assess, understand, and improve traffic light detection. This is a joint work between Bosch Research, including myself, Lin Chan Zhou, Nan Xiang Li, Michael Hoffman, Liu Ren, and also our business partner, Arvind Shikar, Axel Wendt, at the Bosch Urban Automated Driving Division. Autonomous cars rely on object detectors to perceive the environment and make a right decision. Traffic light detection is a crucial component to locate the lights and recognize the light status. However, it is challenging to thoroughly evaluate when and why a detector may fail. Overall, there are two main challenges. First, we usually have massive data to test, and thus, it is a challenge to efficiently summarize and identify those failure cases. Also, it is difficult to understand the root cause of errors. For example, there may be some shifting of lighting condition between the training dataset and the testing dataset. Secondly, in the training dataset, although a detector may see most cases of the traffic lights, but there are still some rare unseen cases that may fail the detector. For example, the motion blurry list here. It is more challenging to reveal the potential edge cases and evaluate the detector's robustness over them. Aiming at these two challenges in this work, we present a visual analytics solution, Vadilate. First, from our training data, we use a semantic representation learning to extract understandable visual factors, such as color, background of the objects. This aim at the first challenge because we can use the learned visual factors to efficiently summarize the data and the performance and also use them to interpret the arrows. For the second challenge of the testing unseen cases, we can generate the edge cases by combining those factors. The key is how to efficiently try various combinations. And thus, we're proposing an adversary learning approach to speed up this process. In this way, we can generate unseen cases. From the training testing data and also generate unseen data uh, cases, we can obtain their detection results from a black box-like model. And then we design interactive visualization to explore and understand this data. Through user interactions, we can obtain the actionable insights and finally, improve the model performance through data augmentation. Next, let's go over each component one by one. Amy added the first challenge. We adapt a disentangled representation learning to extract the semantic factors. How can it learn these factors? So it first encode an image into low dimension space and then try to reconstruct the image with a decoder. The reconstruction loss is used for the decoding process. 
Then, a latent loss is imposed on the bottleneck dimensions. It, so it enforces those dimensions to capture the semantic factors such as color, brightness, and so on. We also introduce other components, such as prediction loss, perception loss, to improve the reconstruction quality. Let's see how to use this representation for visual summarization and the model interpretation. First, we design a tilescape to visually aggregate all objects along the latent dimension of our selection. Secondly, we introduce a hierarchical PCP to navigate the latent space efficiently. Similarly, each dimension is binned and aggregated. The bar plot can show the object distribution over this dimension, and the color can show the detection scores. So let's see how to use them in the system. We can observe the semantic meanings of each dimension here, like the color, the dark list here. The latent representation can also help us to efficiently to lay out and summarize the objects. Finally, we also introduce the rank to interpret interaction. It ranks the top semantic dimensions to interpret the uh, selected data points of users. We can see how to use this in later case study. For the second challenge of generating unseen cases, we propose a semantic adversary learning approach. So here is the key question. Given a traffic light, how can we generate a rather similar traffic light to fail the detector by just a small meaningful changes? So we first encode this object into the semantic latent space. We needed to know how to change these dimensions to generate a traffic light that can fail the detector. For example, here, which can change the dimension of the background the key is to know the fastest direction of the change, namely a gradient. So we introduce a gradient estimation to achieve this. Here, the minimum amount of change over the latent space indicates the robustness of this detector. Let's see an example here. Here, we select a traffic light. The bottom bar shows the generated new traffic lights along the direction of adversary gradient. As we move towards the right, the detection score keeps dropping here, and then we can finally fail the detector. Let's watch this again. See, as we move towards the adversary direction, the score keeps dropping. So this is how we find a weak spot of detector with adversary learning. By leveraging these learning components, we can obtain efficient data representation and the testing results to drive the system. Putting everything together, here is the system user interface. On the top, we have a view to summarize, navigate, basic performance statistics. In the center, a tilescape view to summarize object appearance, detection performance, and adversary gradient. A hierarchical PCP view to show ranked latent dimension with the view factors, scores, and gradient information. And finally, a live view to show a detection results from various traffic scenes. Let's see how we use the system for real-world problems. Here, we use Bosch Small Traffic Light Dataset and a SSD detector. First, we want to understand the semantic robustness landscape. We load all training objects and then to show the score bins. And select the semantic robustness to show the score landscape. From the realization, we can observe Overall semantic robustness is pretty low. Green lights are more robust than the red ones. 
we first decided to use all adversaries to fine-tune the model. Here are the results. With the adversary fine-tuning, we can improve both accuracy and robustness with notable margins. Here, we also observe that in the center, the robustness is pretty low. Let's find out why this is happening. We select a low robustness area and then rank the semantic dimensions to see what dimension contributed most to the low score area. We can see that the dimension 7 of ambiguous color and the dimension 4 of dark light condition contribute the most towards the low robustness. With this observation, we decided to generate more adversary cases from these two dimensions and then fine-tune the model. As for the results, we see that on top of the adversary fine-tune model, the both accuracy and robustness are further improved with our VA-assisted fine-tuning. This indicates that with few interactions, we can gain useful insights to improve our model. What have we learned with this practice? First, we believe that appropriate representation learning can efficiently augment human calculation to understand the complicated data and model space. Secondly, we also found that the semantic adversary generation can guide us to collect new data for testing and also pushing the test boundary towards the real world. Finally, we observed that with appropriate design, we can enable domain experts to have actionable insights through a few interactions. In conclusion, we present an initial research effort of using a VA approach to address some AI testing issues in autonomous driving. And now, this system is being used in our function testing team to tackle some real-world problems. We hope this work can raise some discussion of applying VA research to this exciting domain of autonomous driving. With that, I would like to thank you for your attention and I'm happy to take any questions. Yes, I'm ready. Thanks, Liang, for the great presentation. Uh, this is really good work, and you very well deserved award. Congratulations again. Uh, we're now ready to take questions uh, from people listening to the talk. And uh, as people are coming online with the questions, I would have a First one to ask myself, uh, kind of first of all, how did you pick this very interesting challenge? And, uh, and second, uh, um, how are you, what is your target in terms of level of interaction? Uh, are you getting there? Do you want more? Do you want less? Uh, how is that going to evolve? Yeah, thank you, thank you uh, for the question. So I, I think uh, because uh, for the first question, how we pick uh, this uh, uh, area to work on, uh, as the autonomous driving become a very like uh, a trending topic, and we see a lot of uh, uh, I mean efforts in industry how uh, uh, to help uh, the uh, domain expert to understand how this kind of model works, and to uh, in uh, help people to gain more trust of uh, uh, worth the issue to uh, trust the model behind uh, the wheels. So that's a, uh, the, the first motivation we would like to use the VA, the visual analytics approach to shade it a little bit the thoughts on this. So the traffic like detection as an essential uh, component in autonomous driving, this is our also our first step into this field. We see, we're happy to see there's some, uh, I mean, uh, results coming out of this. I think uh, the second question is uh, how to balance the interaction and uh, so how we can design us, uh, just a little bit in interaction to gain more uh, insights and help the model. So this bothers, uh, actually this also bothers us a lot 
because right now a lot of uh, visual uh, analytic system is to uh, exploratory uh, style. And uh, so we leverage a lot of uh, uh, representation learning. So we uh, put the heavy lift computation into the back end model, and then we just present the critical information to uh, the domain experts. And then they can just use a few interactions and to find the, the most important insights and improve the model. Okay, let me see. I don't know if the system is working correctly. Um, I don't see questions yet. One more thing I wanted to ask is that, um, did you manage to get already some direct uh, impact in the application space, uh, kind of improving the system yeah, and I, the usage? Yes, I think this is also uh, an exciting part to, uh, as you're working with uh, uh, industry lab. So basically you have the uh, real data and the real uh, problem and that you can address. So right now this, uh, we transfer this uh, system to our function testing team. So basically that team is dedicated to test, uh, validate, understand the model uh, in the perception system in autonomous driving. So this is uh, ongoing work. We are expecting more like impact out of this. Okay. I think we are ready to move on uh, to the next uh, best paper award and thank first uh, congratulations again for you, Liang, and all your co-authors. And now we move on. Uh... Okay, let's uh, move on uh, to the best paper award uh, in the InfoViz category. Um, the paper title is Visual Reasoning Strategies for Effect Size Judgments and Decision by Alex Kale, Matthew Kai, and Jessica Holman. And we're going to have here now Alex uh, to present the paper. And after the paper presentation, we'll have a Q&A session. Please, Kyle, go ahead. Uh, Alex, sorry. Hello, my go name ahead. is Alex Kale, and today I'm going to talk about visual reasoning strategies for effect size Good. judgments and decisions. <laughs> this is some work that I did with a frequent collaborator, Matthew Kay, and my advisor, Jessica Holman. We're really excited to share this work with you all. Consider this web article from the Washington Post, which informed the public about the spread of COVID-19 back in March. On the left, we can see how they used animations to build up hypothetical distributions of healthy, sick, and recovered individuals over time, and on the right, we can see that they did this under different assumptions about social distancing. It's critical for the audience to be able to judge the effectiveness of different interventions by comparing distributions. This kind of comparison is called an effect size judgment. How effective is an intervention? How large is the difference between conditions relative to the variability in outcomes? In this study, we measure effect size as probability of superiority, or the proportion of the time that outcomes in the intervention condition are better than in the non-intervention, or control condition. Prior work investigated how different uncertainty visualizations impact this kind of judgment, and they observed that users of air bars and violin plots seem to map mean difference to effect size. This is consistent with evidence that perceived effect size is reduced when we rescale the axis on a chart showing inferential uncertainty like this one to match the full range of predicted outcomes, producing a chart where mean difference is shown on a scale representing the full range of possibilities. This is also related to controversy and empirical evidence about how different axis scaling practices can be deceptive. Reliance on the visual distance between distributions is a heuristic by which people ignore or downplay uncertainty by substituting simple problem solving strategies in place of more complex analytic reasoning. Although people rely on heuristics because they are effective in many situations, critically there are specific circumstances where heuristics lead to suboptimal judgments, and we refer to reliance on suboptimal heuristics as satisficing. 
We set out to study how users may satisfy us by using suboptimal reasoning strategies for distributional comparisons. To test whether users rely on the distance between distributions as a proxy for effect size, we showed distributions with multiple levels of variance on a common axis scale, such that at low variance, distances between distributions look small regardless of effect size. However, at high variance, distance is a better cue for effect size. Here we see the expected pattern of responses as a function of ground truth effect size under the assumption that users rely on only the mean difference. We've grouped these predictions by level of variance, and we can see that at low variance, responses are much closer to 0.5, which represents no effect on this scale. This inverse S-shaped pattern we're looking at reflects underestimation of effect size. Remember this pattern, because it's one of the things that we set out to measure. We wanted to know whether users are more or less likely to rely on this distance heuristic if we give them different uncertainty visualizations, 95% containment intervals, hypothetical outcome plots, probability densities, or quantile dot plots. And we hypothesized that adding means to these visualizations would make people more likely to rely on distance as a proxy for effect size. We thought this would be the case especially for intervals and hypothetical outcome plots, which don't directly encode the mean. So each participant was assigned to one of these four uncertainty visualization conditions at random, and they completed two blocks of trials, one block with means and the other block without. We set up our experiment as a fantasy sports game, where the user's task was to judge the improvement in team performance when adding a new player. On each trial, we asked users two questions, representing two different tasks. The first question was a measure of effect size called probability of superiority. We asked how many times out of 100 did you, uh, ex do you estimate that your team would score more points with the new player than without. This is basically a magnitude estimation task. The second question was an incentivized decision. We asked uh, users whether they would prefer to pay for the new player or keep their team without the new player. And we set up the experiment so that users should intervene on exactly half of trials in order to maximize their monetary reward. At the end of each block of trials, so twice during the experiment, we asked, how did you use the charts to complete the task? Please do your best to describe what sorts of visual properties you looked for and how you used them. We modeled probability of superiority judgments using a linear in log odds model. Here we see responses from one chart user as a function of ground truth probability of superiority. And what we'll show here is that the linear in log odds model can account for both the inverse S-shaped pattern of underestimation bias that we're looking for, as well as the empirical distribution of this data. So we'll start by transforming both the ground truth and the responses onto a log odds scale. The fundamental assumption of the linear and log odds model is that differences in probability are perceptually uniform on a log odds scale. The chart in the upper left illustrates this assumption by showing linear and log odds models with different possible slopes. And in the upper right, when we transform these slopes back into probability units, we can see that slopes less than one uh, reflect the degree of underestimation bias. Now we fit a model to responses for one user, shown in the bottom row, and we can see that the linear and log odds model also does a pretty good job of capturing uh, empirical distribution of this data. We wanted to model decisions relative to a normative standard as well, and to do this we defined a utility optimal decision rule. See, I show you this chart of possible points scored by your team with and without paying for a new player. You win V dollars if your team scores more than 100 points. However, you have to pay C dollars for the new player, shown in red. You should pay for the new player when the probability of winning the award with the new player is greater than the probability of winning the award without the new player plus the ratio of incentives C over V. Thus, the essence of this task is to compare a difference in the probability of winning to a ratio of incentives. This decision rule applies to any scenario where the choice to intervene changes the probability of an all-or-nothing payoff. For example, this um, captures decisions about whether or not to pay for treatment, which may cure a disease. The generality of this formalism makes our task representative of a broad class of decision problems. Doing some algebra that we motivate in the paper, we create a scale of evidence where Zero is the point at which a rational risk-neutral observer would be on the fence about whether or not to pay for the new player. Negative evidence is not enough uh, to justify paying for the new player, and positive evidence is more than enough to justify paying for the new player. Using this evidence scale to define effect size for the purpose of intervention decisions, we compare decisions, such as those from one user shown here, to a normative standard. We fit a logistic regression to binary decisions, creating a distribution of possible model fits. Then we derive the 
uh, point of subjective equality, or PSE, as the level of evidence at which the user is expected to intervene on 50% of trials. By comparing the point of subjective equality to the utility optimal criterion at zero, we have a normative metric for decision quality. We also derive just noticeable differences, or JNDs, but I'm not going to talk about them here, so see the paper for details. In the paper, we present results from these models in a full page figure that walks through everything in detail. But in this talk, I'm just going to pull out some of our most important findings. Here we see linear and log odds model slopes for each uncertainty visualization condition, with means added in orange and without means in pink. These densities are model estimates, not raw data. At low variance, we can see that adding means increases underestimation bias in every condition, pushing slopes to the left or be further below one. Um, now we add the slope estimates at high variance, where we can see that means reduce underestimation with intervals and densities. These small effects of means are consistent with relying on a distance heuristic. We can also see from this chart that with or without means added, quantile dot plots lead to the least bias in probability of superiority estimation. Now let's look at points of subjective equality. At low variance, points of subjective equality are near zero for quantile dot plots with means and densities uh, without means. Now we add points of subjective equality uh, at high variance, and we can see that users have negative points of subjective equality in all conditions, indicating too much intervention. Adding means at high variance exacerbates this bias towards intervening. And we can see also that this bias is smallest for users of intervals and densities, both without means. This suggests that densities without means lead to the most utility optimal decisions across the levels of variance that we tested. Now, the difference in results for our estimation and decision tasks suggests that users process information differently on these two tasks, and that perceptual accuracy does not necessarily feed forward into good decision making. Our qualitative analysis of visual reasoning strategies helps to explain these results. We see that about 80% of our users rely on distance as a proxy for effect size. And of users who rely on distance, only about 8% mention incorporating the spread or variance of distributions into their judgments of effect size, which would reduce bias. This helps to explain why means had sort of a small impact on behavior. If most users are already looking at distance between distributions, and adding means merely reinforces distance as a cue, then we shouldn't expect adding means to change behavior very much. About 36% of our users uh, report judging cumulative probability, say by counting the number of dots or the area beyond a vertical reference line. About 7% of our users mention judging the area of overlap between distributions, as opposed to the gap between them. Both of these strategies should result in less bias than looking at only distance. About 29% of our users mention switching strategies for the same chart, which is important because it suggests that even individual users are not consistent in the way that they read charts. One last strategy is worth mentioning, and it's only relevant to the hops condition. This is counting the frequency of draws changing order. And this is the only way for users to directly decode probability of superiority from any of the visualizations that we showed them. However, only about 16% of hops users employed this strategy, which suggests that most hops users in our study are satisficing. One possible explanation for satisficing with hops in this study is the cognitive load of trying to think through two tasks at once. So then what strategies do chart users rely on to decode distributions? Well, we can see that they satisfy with heuristics. Uh, chart users find some strategy like the distance between distributions that is good enough for their purposes, and they seldom recognize or use the optimal strategy when one exists. Without guidance on how to read a visualization, a user may not interpret that chart in the way that the designer intended. This suggests that we need to develop ways of training chart users to employ the intended or optimal strategy when viewing a visualization. Now, the prevalence of satisficing and heterogeneity in users' visual reasoning strategies suggests that we should probably rethink visualization effectiveness. It is more appropriate to model user behavior with uncertainty visualizations in terms of possible strategies that the user might employ for a specific task, rather than the performance of the average user which represents no particular individual and no particular strategy. We propose new directions for strategy-aware models of visualization effectiveness in the paper. Thank you very much.
Well, thanks, Alex, uh, for the great presentation. Very, very interesting topic. And congratulations again for the award. And let's go for on some questions from the audience. Um, one question is, uh, uh, quantile dot plots uh, seems like a slam dunk for probability of superiority task. Uh, so are there other distribution comparison tasks where you prefer different patterns of performance? Sorry, so the question is, are there other distributional comparison tasks where you'd expect different patterns of performance? Yes. Um, I'd say, I'd say yes, um, for a couple of reasons. Uh, one is that we're asking people to do two tasks at the same time. Uh, the probability of support superiority task is quite hard on its own um, because it's difficult to reason um, about effect size on a probability scale. It's just difficult to reason about effect size, honestly, to numerically quantify it. Um, so I think that with less cognitive load, um, maybe you'd see conditions like hops doing better because you'd see um, less issues sort of keeping track of the accumulating signal over time. Um, so that's one thing. I, I also think that, um, you know, everything from the way that we set up the axis scales um, to the way that we, um, you know, we're sort of optimizing for multiple dependent variables simultaneously in this experiment uh, probably have some influence on exactly uh, the estimates that you get out of the model. Okay. Um, one more question. So did you measure numeracy in your participants? Where did the differences in sensitivity and bias across individual uh, graph types? Um, yeah, so the, the model that we used um, did uh, not assume homogeneity of variance um, and did not assume that effects were uh, the same in each condition. So um, to the extent that there was some uh, variation between conditions in uh, sensitivity and bias, the models um, will have captured that and accounted for it in the results. Uh, the supplemental materials walk through um, some of the effects in greater detail than the paper. One of the challenges with putting together the results section is that um, the full page figure there is showing a four-way interaction. It's sort of challenging um, to unpack all of it um, in the space of one paper. Um, so you might look at the supplemental materials for that. Regarding numeracy, we did include a numeracy questionnaire um, in the uh, interface. Um, although a lot of people scored quite high on it. Okay, sounds good. One more question. Do you think uh, you get the same results if the decision was to remove an ineffective intervention rather than introduce one, uh, basically change the default and should we use a different visual design to reflect that change in the default? Um, yeah, this is, a, this is an excellent question. Um, so in, we ran five pilot studies for this experiment. In one of them, we did try uh, manipulating the framing of the question within subjects so that on half of trials, they were um, trying to obtain some gain as in the paper. Um, and in the other half of trials, they were trying to prevent some loss. Um, and we did uh, see some effects on like the absolute magnitude of decision quality, um, kind of in line with prior work by Tversky and Kahneman, people tend to prefer uh, the certainty of gains over other outcomes. Um, so definitely you would see some, some shift in the absolute position of the point of subjective equality um, if you change the incentives for the task. However, the way that we set things up, we tried to use sort of a, as general um, as possible a framework for the uh, decision-making task, drawing on expected utility theory. So uh, the hope there is that by thinking through the setup of the task very carefully and the formalism that underlies it, that at least the differences between conditions, between visualization designs that we um, observe uh, should generalize. Okay, so we should move on to the next paper award. And thanks again, Alex, for the Thank great presentation. Much. And uh...
And uh, now we go to the last uh, best paper award for full papers, uh, in particular in the scientific visualization area. Uh, the title of the paper is uh, uh, Objective Observer Relative Flow Visualization in Curved Spaces for Unsteady 2D uh, Geophysical flow, Flows. Uh, authors Peter Rautek, uh, Matej uh, Melienek, uh, Joanna Bayer, Jacob uh, Trodel, Hans Peter Pfister, Thomas Tessel, and Markus Hadiger. And uh, without further hesitation, let's have Peter present the paper. Hi, welcome to my talk about objective observer relative flow visualization in curved spaces for unsteady 2D geophysical flow. I know that's quite a long title, but let me try to show you an example. For instance, when we look at a hurricane on the Earth's surface, a location-centric visualization would keep the Earth static and the hurricane moving, while a feature-centric visualization would keep the hurricane at the center of the visualization static and move the Earth underneath. One benefit of our approach is that we can switch from a location-centric visualization to a feature-centric visualization. Here we show a result of our approach that illustrates the difference. First, we see how a hurricane moves while the observer is kept static relative to the Earth. When we visualize the hurricane from the perspective of an observer that moves with it, the Earth moves underneath and the flow stays in place. This can be useful for visualization but also for computation of certain characteristics of the hurricane. The change of the observer does of course not change the phenomenon itself, but only how it is perceived. Here we compare the actual trajectory of the hurricane, shown on the left, with the motion of the observer that was computed by our approach on the right. We can see that the computed observer closely follows the center of the hurricane over time. The question is how do we find such an observer that moves with the hurricane, and what is an observer anyways? For instance, a satellite that rotates around the Earth perceives different relative velocities than an observer that is moving with the Earth. When we keep the satellite static, the Earth appears to rotate in the opposite direction. This rotation corresponds to a time-independent rigid motion. When we observe the Earth from the perspective of an aircraft, we see the Earth rotation changing over time, which corresponds to a time-dependent rigid motion observer. Rigid body motions on smooth manifolds can be described with killing vector fields, named after Wilhelm Killing. We use these killing vector fields to model rigid body observers on the sphere and on other curved manifolds. Now that we know how to represent such an observer mathematically, the question is how do we compute an observer that moves with a feature such as a hurricane? For a feature-centric visualization, we are trying to find an observer that follows a feature in the flow field. Here we see an illustration of a dataset where a vortex moves across the spatial domain. Our goal is to find an observer that perceives the vortex to stay in place. This observed flow field is a steady flow field that does not change over time. Conventionally, a partial derivative is used to compute the time derivative of a flow field, but here we need to find the time derivative of the observed flow field. We derive a new differential operator called the observed time derivative, which equals the partial time derivative plus the Lie derivative. Let's ignore the mathematical details for now. The important thing here is to keep in mind that we do not know the observer that minimizes the time derivative, so we cannot simply use the partial derivative. Instead, we have to define the observed time derivative and use this differential operator in an optimization procedure to find the observer that perceives the flow field to be as steady as possible. So let me briefly review what we have learned so far. We know for a fact that all velocities are relative to an observer. We assume that physical phenomena like hurricanes are captured in the flow data and that changing the observer does not change the phenomenon. So no matter how a phenomenon was observed, if we compute a feature-centric visualization, the result should always be the same. This property that we require from our approach is called objectivity. Let me explain this property visually. Let's say we have a vortex on the sphere. Here we visualize this 2D vortex with path lines that move outward over time, 
So we use the third dimension to visualize time here. All the straight lines going outwards mean that nothing is moving in these regions and only at the center we see the vortex. Let's look at the vortex from a different perspective. We take this vortex, now only shown with three path lines, and see how it would look observed from an aircraft that passes by. If the aircraft flies one-eighth around the sphere, this is what the aircraft would perceive. For one-fourth of a rotation, this is what the aircraft would perceive. And for a full rotation, this is what the aircraft would see. The results are four very differently looking flow fields, but we know they all contain the same phenomenon. What we require from our feature-centric optimization is that it compensates for these different observers. So no matter which of these input fields we take, when we minimize the observed time derivative, we require that the optimal observer field is compensating for the different inputs. When we use the different observer fields in our observer-aware visualization, the outcome is always the same. In the paper we showed that the observed time derivative fulfills this property and that our feature-centric visualization is objective in this sense. So far we have only considered rigid body observers. When we look at real-world phenomena, we see that they are typically not perfectly rigid. Since we do still want to follow these phenomena, we can relax the observer specification a little bit and use a as rigid as possible observer. The good news is that while killing fields only represent perfectly rigid motions, approximate killing fields can be used to represent deforming motions. Similarly to killing fields, we can use them to represent observers. We can co-minimize the deformation as a second term in our optimization. An optimization parameter gives us control of how much deformation is desirable. In the paper we show that the property of objectivity carries over to approximate killing fields as well. Here we visualize how an approximate killing field deforms the spatial domain. We show a visualization of the approximate observer field in the upper right. We can pick a single observer from the approximate killing field and use it as a rigid motion observer. The rigid motion observer is visualized in the center. When we observe the input dataset from the perspective of the rigid motion observer, we obtain a feature-centric visualization without deformations. Our mathematical framework, as well as the implementation of the approach, are fully intrinsic. This means we can compute everything in 2D. It works for flat as well as for curved manifolds. We can perform all computations which are related to the curvature of the manifold purely analytically. Since the flow field data is typically given discretized, we need to approximate the derivatives numerically using a triangulation of the manifold. Manifolds are in general represented with 2D charts, which provide a linearization of the curved space. Here we see the six charts that we use to represent the sphere. The charts are triangulated and are used for the optimization of the observer field as well as the visualizations of the observed flow fields. Here we show another example on the sphere. A vortex street is moving from left to right. Note that line integral convolution cannot be used to visualize the vortices. In blue and red we color coded vorticity to show the moving vortices. From this field we compute an approximate observer field and show how it perceives the input field. Note that the input field is transformed to become nearly steady and that line integral convolution now clearly shows the vortices. Our approach also works on other curved manifolds. Here we show a cylinder with a moving vortex. It is interesting that line integral convolution can only visualize instantaneous velocities and therefore shows the center of a moving vortex at the wrong position. It is also hard to see the swirling motion using path lines. Here we visualize the observer field that follows the vortex around the cylinder. When we visualize the input field relative to this observer field, we see a vortex that stays in place. The center of the vortex is now shown at its... Let me close with an open question about our research. Here I show the high-level overview of our visualization approach that I have presented today. We take an input flow field, 
3D trial optimization procedure to compute an observer field that minimizes the observed time derivative to ultimately get an as steady as possible observed flow field. What we implicitly assumed here with our approach was a very specific intention of the user. We assumed that we want to generate a feature-centric visualization. So the question is, which other user intentions would lead to a meaningful specification of the observer and, as a consequence, result in novel use cases of observer-relative visualization? This is one of the open research directions that we would like to investigate in the future. In this talk, I have tried to get some general concepts across that are related to observer-relative flow visualization. While I gave a rather high-level explanation of our approach, I would like to encourage you to also have a look at our paper, where we cover many more details. Our framework uses concepts from differential geometry and mathematical physics. We use this mathematical language to define the important property of objectivity, as well as a novel differential operator, the observed time derivative. Further, the paper points out subtle differences, such as the use of the covariant derivative to compute the velocity gradient tensor on curved spaces, which is the generalization of the commonly used Jacobian. We believe that our general mathematical framework will provide a solid foundation in the future. It can be used for novel observer wave flow visualizations and computation methods on smooth manifolds, no matter if they are flat or curved. Thank you for your attention and please visit us at vccvisualization.org. Thank you, Peter, for the great presentation and a congratulations again for this important award. And uh, so now we can go to the Q&A session for questions from the audience. Uh, first of all, what new questions can the observer ask using uh, this approach with relative visualization? It's a very good question. And actually, um, I think that's a good open research field uh, for the future, because what we do at the moment is that we assume that we want to um, focus on one feature, like one hurricane. But in reality, there could be uh, different kinds of features that show up in, in flow field topology that we could be interested in and where different kinds of observers and especially multiple observers at the, at the same input data could be interested. So switching between these observers, uh, probably interactively, or decomposing the domain uh, for multiple observer fields uh, in one data set, I think would be a very uh, promising research direction in the future. Uh, so kind of related question is, uh, considering the hurricane example, uh, what uh, do you think that would be the effect of changing between kind of viewer and object uh, perspective in the presentation of the uncertainty and the perception of the uncertainty in the data? See, the uncertainty, if we, I, I suppose we are talking about uh, ensemble uh, simulation. Um, there is nothing that uh, would uh, disturb uncertainty because uh, as long as we stay with a rigid body uh, transformation or a rigid body observer, um, there's really nothing that we destroy in terms of information. So we just compute it from a, how it would look from a different perspective. So we can uh, basically observe flow fields, but we can also observe scalar fields uh, and also certain kinds of tensor fields. So it is a very interesting uh, question also, how could we co-visualize some other data with the flow data, like scalar fields or uncertainty? 
and it's it's perfectly doable. In fact, we have uh, done a couple of tests, um, but have not included that in this paper because we were just simply running out of space. Okay, and uh, one uh, last question is how um, you how is your approach kind of related to other techniques that decompose uh, vector fields uh, like Helmut Ock, Helmut's Ock decomposition uh, in representing different components? Our approach, I, I would less see it as a decomposition, uh, but rather as um, a, a transformation in a way that uh, you, you have a large um, space of um, possibilities how you can um, how you can transform the input and how to observe it from a different uh, perspective. And one of them being um, observing it from a rigid uh, body observer and the other one also allowing small deformations. So it's, it's not really the composition, it is a bit more uh, um, involved uh, and it's, it's also the result of an optimization procedure. So there's no, there's no straightforward uh, method to compute it uh, like a decomposition. Okay, well, thanks again, Peter. And now we're gonna Thank move on to the next session. Okay, so now we move on to the best paper award for short papers. Uh, and the title of the paper is the Anatomical uh, Edutainer by Marwin Schindler, Hinsangi Wu, and Renata Georgia Raidu. And uh, Marwin will present the paper, uh, after which we'll have a, another Q&A session. Hello, my name is Marvin Schindler. I'm a master's student at the Technical University of Vienna, and I'm going to present to you our work on the anatomical edutainer. This is a tool that we recently developed with the aim of easing the necessary workflow to create affordable paper-based physicalizations of the human anatomy. This work is motivated by the benefits of physical visualizations, where the data is represented by the means of a physical object digitally on the screen. Physicalizations have proven in the past to provide a high degree of engagement for the user, enabling them to focus better on the underlying data and to help remembering the embedded information. Such physicalizations like anatomical model kits have been used for many centuries in medical and anatomical education, and with the recent advantages in fields like digital fabrication, there have been a lot of new proposed physicalizations in the last years, such as advanced model kits or contextual 3D prints, which offer great insight into the underlying anatomical data, but they are still not accessible and affordable for the general public. And that is why we propose the Anatomical Edutainer, a workflow to guide the easy generation of two-dimensional and three-dimensional physicalizations for tangible and interactive anatomical edutainment. Our physicalizations work on the basis of being accessible and affordable, using only easy to find material such as paper and common colored foils or colored light, and also a bit of patience for assembling the three-dimensional paper craft. The main concept behind our physical visualizations is to take advantage of the optical properties of our physical world. Our visualizations can be inspected under appropriate colored lenses or colored lights in order to reveal distinct and nested anatomical structures. To do so, we exploit the properties of light and the light modulating characteristics of a typical colored lens. The possible colors to employ are shown in the triangle on the right, where opposite colors absorb each other and can be used as filters. So colored lenses can be employed to isolate nested anatomical structures, 
that would otherwise be occluded on paper. For example, here the bones, which are colored in cyan, can be seen under a red filter, while all other structures are hidden. The second concept that we employ is to engage and entertain the use of the visualization through the interactivity of a tangible paper craft. Here the anatomical structures undergo an unfolding step to ensure that they can be printed and assembled to a three-dimensional paper craft. The assembled paper craft can then be explored under colored lenses or lights. The benefit of our proposed physicalizations is that anyone with access to a computer and a common printer can create them. Also, colored filters or lights are widely available and affordable. The templates of our physicalizations need to be created only once and can easily be reprinted, which makes them an affordable and accessible tool for educational purposes, may be useful at exhibitions or museums. And the tangible character of the three-dimensional paper craft assembly adds to the enjoyment of the process, making them especially suitable for children's anatomical edutainment. Here you can see our workflow in more detail. The first step is to acquire data. We use generic anatomical models acquired from the Body Parts 3D website. But if segmentations coming from patient data are available, those could be used as well. From the loaded models we select only the area of interest and assign the contained anatomical structures, visual properties which match our selection of colored filters. In this work, a combination of cyan, magenta and yellow can only be used for the meshes, so that they can be seen under red, green and blue filters. At this point, the digital visualization can be previewed under digital filters. Then the users have to select whether they want to create a two-dimensional or a three-dimensional visualization. For the two-dimensional visualization, we only need to assign each anatomical structure to one of the other quad colors, based on the light absorption scheme. Color blending is employed between the images of the individual meshes to form a single image. As the renderings tend to get dark with multiple overlapping color values, normalization and brightening is performed. And the users can always use the digital filters to inspect how each structure will look like in the finished visualization. So the two-dimensional physical visualizations already offer some degree of interactivity. But a three-dimensional model may offer a higher degree of engagement, understanding and also entertainment, while preserving better the spatial context of anatomy. To create such a model, a common paper mesh template is generated, then wrapped around each individual structure and used to create a combined texture. This texture is applied back to the combined paper mesh, which can be printed and folded into a three-dimensional paper craft. When creating these models, it is also possible to adjust a few things about the projection of the anatomical structures before saving the created paper template. The folding of the paper craft took us around 15 minutes for most of the models that we tried. Here you can see some of our results. The first row of figures are photos taken from a two-dimensional physicalization that shows the human skull, the brain and the vessels under the three colored foils. The second row shows photos taken from a three-dimensional physicalization of a pelvis paper craft, masked using colored light. The light can be positioned externally or internally, which might be useful for keeping your hands free or for larger models. A direction that could be further investigated in the future would be the use of other colors and filters to accommodate more than three structures. But most importantly, we need to conduct a user study to assess the educational benefit and feasibility of the proposed physical visualization approach. This already concludes my talk on our work on physicalization for interactive and tangible anatomical edutainment. Thank you very much for your attention. I'm looking forward to answering any questions. And if someone wants to download the template for the pelvis papercraft, feel free to just scan the displayed QR code. Thank you. Now we would like to show you a short demo of our anatomical edutainer. Enjoy watching.
Okay, well, thank you again uh, uh, for the great presentation. And let's go from the questions and, and congratulations again for the uh, award. Uh, let's go for questions from the audience. Uh, so uh, one question would be, could two filters be used to make this uh, stereoscopic? That's definitely a nice idea. I gotta admit, we didn't thought about that one. So maybe we will look more into that in the future. It could be problematic on the paper graphs. Um, I can think of some scenarios where it doesn't really work out, but definitely on the two-dimensional visualizations. Okay. Um, one practical question is that, are you planning to provide or even sell those prints online? <laughs> Um, yeah, the, we already provided uh, provided only one um, under the QR code at the end of the slides. Um, but the plan would be to make them more available available and accessible, definitely. And not uh, for money. <laughs> okay. Um, so you, you said already in the talk that you're planning a, a user study. Uh, do you already have a kind of a sense of what, what will be the way to measure effectiveness in uh, teaching education? Um, so we definitely want to make a more in-depth user study. Um, and we're still planning that. And I'm a bit shy on giving too much information on how we would um, ex um, do that in detail. But we definitely want to make a much more in-depth user study on the um, memorability benefits of our visualizations. Okay, that's very good. So uh, this uh, paper model lacks weight. Uh, um, is there a way to remedy that aspect? Um, I also, we're also thinking about that, but it's, um, there are a bit more important um, add-ons and improvements for the application right now. And after then we would look more into structural integrity and the weight the polypro model. Okay. And uh, last question is that did you do an investigation regarding the sensitivity of the filters, for example, with respect to different printers and ink or display, they may work uh, better or worse. Um, so do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, we used uh, different printers um, for our dummies and most of the um, output colors were fine and worked with um, the typical filters we had, the, the typical light filters. Um, I mean, the laser printer definitely gave me the best results, but I think it shouldn't matter which printer you use as long as you uh, rely on magenta, cyan, and yellow. Okay, well, thanks, uh, Marwin, again for the great presentation Thank you very much. And, and congratulations for the award, and we'll reconvene in a few minutes for the keynote of the conference.
So welcome back to the this 2020 conference. It is my true honor and pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker this year. Uh, Mario Capecchi uh, is a renowned uh, molecular geneticist. Uh, is currently a distinguished professor of human genetics and biology at the School of Medicine here in Utah. He received a long list of awards, just to name a couple, National Medal of Science, American Association of Cancer Research, Lifetime Achievement Award, and Albert Lasker Award on Basic Medical Research. Um, if I had to read all the awards, this would go on longer than the keynote itself. So I'll, I'll just uh, 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 remind you that also Mario was the winner, uh, co-winner of the Nobel Prize in Physiology and, or Medicine in 2007. Uh, and he's now here with us and is uh, giving an address on the title of the making of a scientist. And who better than Mario knows about that. So without further ado, I'll let Mario speak to our audience. And at the end, we'll have some time uh, for uh, a Q&A session. First of all, it's a pleasure uh, for giving me this opportunity to uh, talk with you. And uh, uh, let me begin by starting out with uh, what I do as a scientist. This lecture will have three parts. The first will be an encapsulation of what we do. The second part will be a little bit more embarrassing. It will be more a personal journey. And then the last part, I hope it'll be fun. It'll just be a journey uh, to Stockholm. So what do I do as a scientist? So everything that we do with respect to genetics is dependent on this molecule. I think all of you are familiar with it. This is DNA. And it's an amazing molecule, both in terms of its simplicity as well as its depth. Its function is to archive information and enormous amounts of information. These are the characters that worked out the structures. Uh, Watson uh, at age 25 on your left and Crick at age 40 on, uh, on the right. Uh, but we should also give a lot of uh, credit to Rosalind Franklin because she provided the picture of the B form, uh, the crystallographic images that uh, Watson saw and then Watson and Crick were able to deduce that the structure of DNA must be a double helix. And this is the secret of DNA in its simplest form. This shows only two base pairs, 
Uh, and so the, what's holding the bases together are the ribophosphate backbone, and then the bases are the information. It's a four letter alphabet. And what you're seeing here is uh, on one strand, there is a thymine, and then on the opposite strand is hydrogen bonded to the thymine is an adenine. And then on the one strand, there's a cytosine, and on the opposite strand, there's a guanine. And it was Watson that first was aware, just using uh, uh, cardboard models that were to scale, by moving them around, he was able to deduce that whenever on one strand there's a thymine, on the opposite strand, you can only have an adenine. And if on the other, on one strand there is a guanine, then on the opposite strand, there is a cytosine. And this simple structure then told us right away how is the information duplicated from the mother cell to the two daughter cells or from uh, the parents to the uh, sibling. So what it shows is here is a, uh, two strands of green DNA. And all you have to do is separate the strands and each forms a template for the other strand. And now you've made a near perfect copy of the uh, two strands, starting with a single strand, going from the mother cell, then down to the two daughter cells. Okay. So then the next question is, why do gene targeting? I think one question in uh, grants, we never say why we do something, but I think it's always in, uh, important to consider why are you doing those experiments you want to be doing. Uh, and I thought I th what you're aware of is that every cell in your body has a very complicated instruction manual, enormously complicated. And we also chose to do gene targeting in a mouse. And then the question arises, why the mouse? Here's our patients. Uh, and, and the reason is that it's a, it's a mammal, okay? So in that sense, it was likely if you could manipulate genes within a mouse, then it would become essentially the surrogate for the human body. We are both mammals, and as mammals, greater than 99.9% .9 of all genes are common to all mammals. We have a common set of genes, we have a common uh, developmental plan, physiology, nervous system, reproductive biology, and on and on and on. So whatever we're learning in the mouse will also be directly applicable to humans. And even in cases where the mouse does not recapitulate what's going on in the human, this is especially interesting because that tells us how a mouse differentiates from a human. So the process of gene targeting takes advantage of a process known as homologous recombination. And here I'm illustrating homologous recombination these are two different double helices of DNA, and they have the exact same sequence. I've colored them different colors so you can distinguish them. And if you have a homologous recombination of brick, you literally have a breakage and rejoining of the two strands. And so therefore, now we're having a yellow and a blue strand, and a blue and a red strand. Since the edge sequence is identical, and the process of, of homologous recombination is very precise, the sequence across that junction has not changed. Okay? And so the only way you could see it is if, if I color it. Okay? And that is the important part, that it requires homologous uh, sequences, they line up, and then you have a, an exchange of strands. Okay? So this is actually what we envisioned as homologous recombination, that is gene targeting. So the top line represents your favorite gene that you've isolated and sequenced and know that it's exact sequence. The asterisk represents a change you've introduced to that sequence. That can be a single base pair, 10, thousands, and now we're working on it being millions of base pairs, okay? So once introduced into the cell, this sequence searches the entire genome, three billion base pairs, finds the same sequence, and then does two recombination events on either sides through homology, thereby transferring the asterisk, whatever, how you've changed the text, then to the uh, chromosome of the living cell. So this is homologous recombination as we visualized it. So in 1980, I submitted a grant uh, proposing to do gene targeting. And the response was, oh, sorry. <laughs> 
the, the response was that they deemed the project impossible. Okay? And they made a very cogent argument. They said that the probability of the exogenous DNA ever finding the same sequence in the genome of a living cell was vanishingly small, and therefore the process would not work. So now you're faced with a dilemma. What do you do? First of all, I should point out that this, it, was, it was a very competent set of scientists. I actually even knew a couple of them on that committee. There were 18 people, uh, but they uh, deemed it was, it, it was impossible and therefore not worthy of support. So we could do two things. One is we could drop it and work on something else, or the other is to uh, use funds from other projects to then actually fund this, uh, this project. Now that was taking an enormous risk because if four years later, I hadn't had any results, then I would be in deep trouble. I would likely have to find a new profession because NIH was no longer going to support me. But we chose that pathway. And the reason was that I felt that if the homologous recombination was within a certain range of probabilities, I could handle it. If it was beyond that range, I couldn't. And, and, and the reason I couldn't is I just didn't, wouldn't have enough money to do the experiments. Okay, so we went on ahead. And fortunately, four years later, we had results. Okay. So I submitted the grant with the new results to the exact same study section. And this time they looked at it and said, we're glad we, did, we didn't follow our advice. So they had even a, a bit of humor. So, uh, but in, in the renewal, I added even more uh, pizzazz to the uh, experiment. And now instead of saying, I'm just gonna do homologous recombination in tissue culture cells, I'm gonna extend it to the mouse. That is, I was gonna generate mutations in a living mouse. Now, the problem with that was that I, I knew I needed what are called ES cells, embryonic stem cells. And embryonic stem cells did not exist. They were a figment of imagination. Now, what did exist was what I call mouse embryonic carcinoma cells, EC cells. Okay? And they're derived from a tumor, but they are capable of multiple uh, <coughs> fates. Okay, so if you put them in an embryonic environment, they could contribute to some tissues, but not others. And the main problem was that they did not contribute to germline. They not, and therefore, if we ever wanted to do a targeting uh, experiment, we would have to do each mouse separately every time uh, that we had it. We couldn't breed them because sperm and eggs were, were not being made and these cells did not contribute to it. But I'd heard a rumor that Martin Evans in Cambridge, England was starting to work on uh, isolating uh, EC-like cells, but instead of from a tumor, from an embryo proper, from a small, very uh, young uh, embryonic uh, mouse. Okay. And, so, and so I called him and asked, uh, this is Martin Evans, uh, Cambridge, England. And I called him and asked, are you actually working on these cells? And he says, yes. And the experiments look like they're going very well. And I said, fantastic. Uh, could I come to your lab and learn how to work with these cells and, and how to make mice from these cells? And he said, sure. Uh, and so I packed up my bag with my technician, my wife. We went to Cambridge, England and spent uh, several weeks learning how to make ES cells and then how to make uh, mice from ES cells themselves. And this is important because uh, what I'm going to point out is that collaboration is much stronger than competition. He could have said no, and we each of them, I had half the puzzle. I could do gene targeting in mammalian cells. He had the other half of the puzzles. He had cells that they could use to make mice but together we could then develop gene targeting. And we decided to, comp, uh, to collaborate as opposed to comp, compete. And I think the other aspect of, comp, uh, of collaboration is that now you're controlling the reins in a sense, we now can really work uh, to make the, comp, the technology uh, friendly, that is user friendly. 
because if we're the only ones who could do it, the technology is useless. But if we can make it simple enough that other people can utilize it, then it becomes very important. Okay. So let me take you through the process itself. These are embryonic mass embryonic stem cells. That's a clone of cells right in the center. And then they're growing in a feeder layer, the surprising supplying factors to maintain these cells in culture. These cells can be grown forever. They're, uh, they have, they're immortal. Uh, and we can put them in the freezer, pull them back out into the freezer. And it's these cells that we then manipulate genetically. That is change a single gene in these cells and then use these cells to make mice, which then all the, every cell in the mouse would have this particular mutation. And then we can see the effects of the mutation. So how do we make a mouse? This is a pre-implantation embryo. And then you see a, a needle and it's full of the ES cells that we manipulated and changed the single gene. And we deposit them right into the embryo. And you can see the cells going into the embryo. The cells in the bottom are called the inner cell mass. And it's those cells that will give rise to the embryo proper. And these cells will actually mix with them and then participate in making the embryo. And in fact, there's a little trick. The ES cells are actually developmentally just a little ahead of the ones in the, in, in the embryo that is being the recipient. And therefore, they actually participate more than they should with respect to making the next, uh, the embryo proper, because they're a little bit ahead developmentally. Then once we've intro introduced the ES cells into the blastocyst, uh, the recipient embryo, then we can transfer those, that embryo into a mouse, a pseudo-pregnant mouse. Uh, we make a little slit in the back and then get it into the oviduct, which then gets into the placenta, and then the embryo attaches and then continues to develop. So we've done a trick here. There are now actually four parents. There are the two that make the blastocyst, and there are the two that made the EF cells. Okay? And we've chosen those from different mice with different coat colors. So that then when we actually, the embryo comes out, what we'll see is a brown and black mouse. And in fact, often it's about 90% uh, derived from the cells in culture and then 10% coming from the uh, blastocyst itself. Okay? And in fact, now we have tri uh, tricks. We can make 100% of the embryo be derived from the cells in culture. Okay. So that then allows us to get targeted mutations. Let me just go backwards now a little bit and say, where did the idea of developing gene targeting in the mice arise in the first place? And there are two parts of this. One is a figment of imagination. That is, you have to think. My mentor, Watson, uh, Watson James Watson, the same person in the structure of DNA that worked out the structure of DNA, uh, he always used to tell me, takes the same energy to work on a difficult problem compared to a simple problem. So why spend your energy on a simple problem? Go for the big one. Okay? And so that's the one part that is a figment. You know, you think uh, that this would uh, allow you to do something that other people have never been able to even think possible. Okay? The other is the nuts and bolts, how you're going to do it. Okay, so there's both components and they're both important. Now, what I heard in, uh, in the literature at that time, this was in uh, 1977, uh, Wiggler and Axel had, uh, uh, published a paper showing that if you take DNA and you add calcium phosphate to it, it forms a precipitate. If you take that precipitate and sprinkle it over cells, then about one in a million cells will pick up that DNA in functional form. For example, if the cells don't have a thymidine kinase gene and you introduce DNA that has a thymidine kinase gene, then they will get that gene and then function. And the DNA actually it's randomly inserted somewhere in the genome and then functions. Okay? And uh, it does it at a frequency about one in a million. And I read that paper and I said, wow, that's fantastic. And then I read it a little deeper and I said, why is the efficiency so low? One in a million. And what could be the limiting factors of not making it more efficient? 
And so I thought of a while and then I said, well, maybe it's the DNA is not getting to nucleus and not working very efficiently. And, so per, and if we substituted a different technique, for example, if we used a hypodermic to actually inject the DNA into the nucleus itself, then we would know the DNA is there and maybe that'll increase the frequency. The other problem may be that once the DNA gets into it, it inserts randomly in the genome, and then sometimes you land in a, a, a genome-rich region and it gets stressed. Another time it gets inserted into a desert and therefore doesn't function. So those are the things that I talk about. And so I first did, uh, used the DNA, and then I thought, well, viruses do something quite similar. They infect a cell, for example, a coronavirus uh, infects the cells, and then that's DNA or RNA gets converted to DNA, then inserts into the DNA and then functions. So they must know how to do it, deal with this. So they may have elements on the virus, small DNA elements that allow that gene, their genes to be expressed in, no matter where they land in the particular uh, genome of that host cell. Okay? And so what I decided was, well, I'll take two viruses that are very different a DNA uh, a lytic virus, SV40, I chop it into little pieces, and then I'll take another virus, a retrovirus, it's an RNA virus, and that makes me a DNA and gets into the genome. I'll take little pieces of it, and then insert it next to the gene I'm interested in getting in, uh, into the cell, and then do the experiment. Now, so that remember, we're going to introduce the DNA using a hypodermic going directly using uh, essentially uh, <clears throat> manipulators uh, and under high power microscope, be able to go to the nucleus of the cell, and this is a, our mouse ES cells, and then you go directly uh, into the nucleus, deposit the DNA, and then see what happens. And now instead of the frequency being one in six, it was about one in three. One in three cells got the DNA in functional form and then did its thing. So that was an enormous increase in frequency. And any time you have an enormous increase in frequency, that allows you to do things that you couldn't possibly do uh, another, in any other situation. Okay, so now we had a system. Uh, it's still going in randomly, but at least we know that DNA functions and it, uh, we can do so at a fairly good frequency. Now, the second property, the property where the, a little piece of DNA is required to then make that, uh, <clears throat> that gene functional, no matter where it's put into the genome, that it turned out contained enhancers. And enhancers didn't exist in that uh, at that time. Okay? So this is one of the very first experiments that contributed to the thinking about enhancers. That is, there are DNA elements that control the expression of genes uh, uh, even distal to that piece of DNA. But the thing that I found most fascinating is the last heading, that is head-to-tail concatomers. And what are they? So here we have a DNA, uh, and what we do is inject actually multiple copies of it. And DNA, like any text, has a direction to it. So you read, uh, you know, we read uh, left to right, okay? The DNA has a direction to it. And so we can put arrows on that DNA. And what we found is indeed the DNA was uh, inserted randomly into the genome, but it was all in one place and all the arrows were pointing the same direction. That's what a head to tail concatamer is. That is, they're, uh, they're all in the same direction. And we could inject a thousand of them and they were all in the same direction. Now that cannot occur randomly, okay? That would be like throwing a thousand uh, uh, coins in the air and every time you have heads. That's not possible. Okay? So we knew that there had to be a mechanism for that. And there were two possibilities. One is that one would go in and then it would function as a template. Think of it as a sausage machine that then you put in the sausage and then all the sausages would be made from that one sausage and they would all come out uh, on a string all in the same direction. The other was by homologous recombination, what I just talked about, okay? And so envision this, that is, here you have A, B, C, D, uh, to say uh, 
four different genes all in a row, and we have a circle, and then A, B, C, D on it, and a homologous recombination inserts it wherever there's homology, and then you would get a duplication. And you could keep doing this and doing this until you had a thousand of them all in a row. And then that says that the cell has the machinery to do homologous recombination. And that was a big break because all of a sudden, not only do we know it, it's, the machine is there, but it's there in any cell. We use uh, skin cells, okay, somatic cells, and that had the machinery to do homologous recombination. That was not known at that time. Uh, homologous recombination was known, but it was not known that it was present in every cell and it was efficiently working. So now we had a system that we could think about because homologous recombination is there, we could take advantage of it. And remember, I showed you how we were going to take advantage. And one of the first genes we inactivated was HPRT. HPRT has several advantages. One is also, it's on the X chromosome. And so if you're a male, you have one X chromosome and one Y chromosome. So that means that we could change that one gene and then we would get an effect. Most genes are there in two, two copies. And if you get, you have one copy and the other copy, and if you inactivate one, you still have the other. Okay? So you don't see anything. You don't see a, what we call a phenotype. But on the X chromosome, if there's only one, then there's only gonna be one copy. Okay, and so then what we did was to inactivate it using a selectable marker, and we put it uh, six, seven, and eight up on the, the top part here, that represents the vector, uh, targeting vector we're changing. Uh, and uh, what we've done is to insert a selectable gene in the middle of the eighth exon. That inactivates the gene, and then we can then select for loss of HPRT, which we can do in cell, cell culture, as well as gaining uh, a neogene, which gave it another property, which we could also select for. And the probability of those two events occurring is about one in 10 to the 12th. So it's not gonna occur randomly, uh, but if it went via uh, gene targeting, then maybe we could see it. And indeed it does work. And we found uh, clones and they were, uh, at a re uh, in fact, every clone that we found that was HPRT negative, as well as neopositive, then was a targeting event. So this allowed us to be, a, we have a workhorse, okay? We have a, a phenotype in cell culture, we could select for it, and then once we get it, now we can improve the efficiency. We can look at all the parameters that affect the efficiency and improve it and improve it until now it's at a workable uh, state, okay? So, and that's an example. Let me give you a more reasonable example of gene targeting. In most cases, a gene doesn't have a property in cells. In fact, that's one of the few cases that we could select for a gene property in cells. Okay? Uh, but if we want to inactivate a gene in the mouse, in the cell culture, it's not going to have any phenotype if it requires the whole mouse to have the phenotype, for example, a behavior or whatever. If it requires a heart, a beating heart, then you would have to have a beating heart and so on. So we want a be able to do gene targeting under non-selectable conditions. So do we have tricks to do that? And indeed we did. Uh, and the gene I'm gonna show you is a gene that we started to talk about, uh, work on uh, quite a few years ago, it's called Hox genes. These are genes that are important for making the body plan. It makes sure that our head is here, our arms are here, all the different organs are in the right place, you hook them all together and you have a functional being. Okay, so Hox genes are very important for making all body plans of all organisms. And there are lots of them. There are 39 genes in humans and mice, and the humans and mice have the exact same set of Hox genes. Okay. We chose a gene called Hox13, okay? And C means uh, on the C chromosome, and then 13 is the 13th member of this particular family. So we can do a trick. We can take a gene that, for example, makes a blue color and stick it in the middle of HOXC13, and then wherever HOXC13 functions, those cells will turn blue. We can take another gene from a jellyfish that makes a protein that fluoresces green. We can put it back in the middle of that same gene, and wherever that gene functions, then those cells will be fluorescently green. And what you can see is that this gene is in whiskers. 
case, you can bruise whiskers and you can see uh, <clears throat> fluorescently green whiskers. If we look at the nails of this mouse, then we can see blue cells in the nails and we can see green fluorescence. Uh, if we use GFP, the green fluorescent protein in nails. Okay, so that tells us where the gene functions. Now, that doesn't tell us what it's doing. We simply know somehow it's doing something with nails and something to do with whiskers. Now, how do you find what it's doing? Remember that we get two genes. So if we have one defective gene, we don't see an effect. But if we cross these mice together, males and females, then we'll have two defective copies one fourth of the time, and then we can see the effects of the mutation. And that's shown here. And what we can see is plus plus means two good genes, plus minus means one that we've disrupted by gene targeting, uh, no effect. We knock out, cross those and get a mouse that has no uh, HOXC13 working. And then we can see this mouse has alopecia, okay? no hair whatsoever. And it also has defective nails. Uh, so there it tells us it's required for making nails. Now we can go to a human population and ask, are there people that have alopecia, that is they're bald, and they have defective nails? And they do, and I can find those people. And then we can ask for a DNA sample, and the prediction is they have a defective Hoxie C13 gene. And in that, indeed, that's true. So that closes the circle. Wherever we find in mice is also true in humans. Okay, so that, that gives you sort of a flavor of what we do. And now we're working using this technology actually to do neuro, uh, study neuropsychiatric disorders. But let me now go into the second part of the story uh, that is early influences. And I think everybody's early influence is their mother. And this is a picture of my mother. Uh, she, this is when she was about 19. And she was an aspiring uh, poet and writer. She actually then uh, went to the Sorbonne and uh, was a lecturer there. And she got politically involved. But let me go back a little bit. And that is if her, her, gener her, her mother and father, her mother was, actually was born in Oregon. And as a teenager, she decided she wanted to be, be a painter. And she talked her a mother to go with her to Florence in order to learn how to paint. And she was very interested in impressionist paintings. And she became a painter. And here's an example. This is a family. This is uh, the three members of the family. My mother is in the middle. My two uncles are on the side. This is in Florence, Italy. And this still exists and I've been there and the olive trees are there and so on. Uh, this is another painting she made. Uh, and this is my mother and again, my younger uh, uncle, uh, her brother, and they were having a tea party. And she, they lived in a, a beautiful setting uh, <clears throat> uh, in Florence. They had a villa and then she could do painting and she just flourished and everything was going fine. And then the First World War came along and her husband was actually German and he was a architect. I mean, uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, and he, uh, was uh, German, and then he was conscripted into the uh, uh, German army uh, when the First World War uh, came. So they, was, because they were professionals, they put him into 1812 regalia with plumes and feathers and, on helmets and so on, sent him out in the field, and their own uh, troops didn't recognize him and machine gunned them all down. And so now my uh, grandmother had to uh, now uh, live on her own, and all of a sudden she had uh, no source of income except for her painting. And she decided to change the villa into a finishing school for American uh, budding scientists, uh, artists. And so she brought them over and taught them the refinements and so on, and thereby kept the villa going. That's the environment that she grew up. Then my mother, once she gets ready to uh, do a profession, as I mentioned, she was a poet, and in at the Sorbonne, she got politically very involved. And so she began profiteering against, this is in the 30s, uh, against Hitler and against Mussolini. And she knew that that was a very dangerous uh, out, uh, ha uh, vocation. 
uh, and therefore then moved uh, up to uh, the Dolomites in Italy. And this is her in the foreground, and in the background, you can say as she lay that she rented, and there she's continued her pamphleteering against Nazism and fascism. Uh, and uh, that's where I was born and lived for three and a half years. But she knew her uh, time was a shortcut because she's still continuing doing her political activity and she knew the Gestapo would eventually come. And they did. And when I was uh, three and a half years old, uh, the Gestapo came to the villa. I could actually uh, understand what they were saying because I understood both German and Italian at that time. And it was clear that she was gonna be taken away. She had deposited all her wealth to her, uh, to a, a farming family and said, if something happens to me, please take care of Mario. Uh, and uh, then that happened. So she was taken off. She was taken to Dachau, uh, which is just outside of Munich, a uh, concentration camp. And then I lived in uh, a farm uh, and it's shown here. Whoops, this is Dachau. Uh, uh, just, to, just to give you a feeling as to what the situation he was, she was in. She was a very attractive woman. So you can imagine uh, what she had to go through in Dachau. This is actually the farming village that she sent me to. And uh, because of the Nobel Prize, they actually uh, found this place. And the same family that was there uh, when uh, I was there uh, is still there, the next generation. And I, but I remember where the ch chicken coops were and so on and so forth. So it was a good life for about a year. And then the money ran out. And at that point, they had to turn me out in the streets. And I was an orphan, essentially, uh, traveling the streets of Italy uh, and going essentially from town to town as I, my cover was being blown because the only source of food was to steal. Uh, and so, I, and I did this for now for four and a half years, uh, uh, from four years, four and a half to nine. And then uh, at that point, I became sick and was hospitalized for typhoid and malnutrition. And at this time, this is 1945, the war was over. And fortunately, my mother survived and it took her about a year uh, and a half to actually find me. And she traced everywhere and then finally found me. And she came and uh, uh, gave me uh, food and gave me, you know, in the, in the hospital, there was no food. So everybody was dying, essentially, all the kids were dying. Uh, and unfortunately, she came uh, and she was able to uh, take me out. And then uh, in a week, we were sailing for Italy because her brother was living in the United States and supplied the boat money. And there I went to Pennsylvania in a commune. My uncle, uh, this is the youngest uh, uncle, uh, Edward, uh, he was a physicist and he started a commune with, with uh, 12 other members and they, uh, everything was owned in common. So here I go from a, a completely non-social situation where I'm living in the streets, uh, procuring my own food and then going to a commune where now all of a sudden I have 65 parents. And, uh, but it was a perfect place for me simply because uh, you know they were very receptive the Quaker background, and they provided uh, lots of activities. Uh, they didn't believe in goods, but they did believe in education, and they did believe in serving uh, your country. Uh, and so uh, that's the atmosphere I was brought in. And then uh, this is a picture of me about uh, probably a month after arriving from Italy. Uh, and this is my uncle. Uh, he, I told you, was a physicist. He, for example, was the uh, developer uh, of the first electron microscope. Uh, and here is working on something that he didn't uh, like very much, and that's TV. Uh, he worked there uh, at RCA in developing TV, both uh, black and white as well as color TV. And I should point out that no TV was allowed in our house. Uh, this is a school I went to in terms of high school. It's a, a preparatory school, a very excellent school academically. Uh, it's called George School in Pennsylvania. And then from there, I went to Antioch as a college. And that was important because what they had was a work study program. You work a quarter and then you study a quarter. You work another quarter and you study. And the jobs were everywhere. 
and if and they were related to what you were interested in. I was interested in science, and therefore I had lab jobs, and I went to MIT and worked there for multiple years, uh, just as molecular biology was being born. And I was exposed to this, and that was very seductive. I was a physics major, but completely switched to molecular biology once I saw uh, the creativity of molecular biology. This is my mentor, Jim Watson, uh, and uh, he was a fantastic mentor. Uh, and then I, from there, I went to Utah. Uh, I actually had a faculty job at Harvard. Uh, we didn't uh, look eye to eye. We had very different philosophies. Uh, and in particular, two things were, were critical. One is I knew I wanted to work on long-term uh, ex experiments. And uh, that's not possible at Harvard because every day you're asked, what's new? And so you start working on projects in the few days you had results. Whereas what I wanted to work on, I knew it would take me years. Uh, and uh, so I decided to leave and come to Utah. And here is uh, living in Utah. This is my wife, and our first child. Uh, and we lived way up in the mountains. Uh, and here is in the winter time. This is our daughter. Uh, lots of snow, beautiful views. This is in the springtime, uh, in the fall, and in the winter. And having that expands, I think, also contributes to having an open mind. So uh, this was the perfect environment for me, uh, and that is where I settled. So now, in the next few minutes, I'll just describe uh, going to Stockholm. So remember that it's in winter. Uh, th there's about four hours of daylight, uh, but it's still beautiful, even though it's only a short day, because the ocean essentially inundates the whole city. So wherever you are, you see boats, and you can, it's just grand, beautiful. And then here's the hotel we stayed at. It was gorgeous. Uh, I'll tell you a short story about that. Uh, when we arrived, there was long lines of people waiting to be having signatures, you know, they wanted autographs. And, they, you know, everybody's flocking and getting autographs and so on. And there's a beautiful setting. And then uh, four days later, the, uh, the activities last for 12 days. Okay. And four days later, Bruce Bernstein shows up at the hotel. Okay. And now what you can see is the whole crowd just shifting. So that's the difference between a rock star and a scientist. Okay. These are the three scientists that uh, won the prize in uh, medicine, uh, Oliver Smitty's, and, uh, and you already met uh, the middle figure who has developed a mouse embryonic stem cell, Martin Evans. Okay, here's the actual uh, where you receive the prize. Uh, and here is a closer view. The front line is the uh, people that are actually uh, won the prize that year. And then the second uh, several, couple rows is actually the 50 members that actually uh, make the decision that, for that particular year. And it's a strange ceremony. You have a huge table, they have a huge table. And they go into the table, and the, uh, into this room, the door is locked and they have to reach a consensus. Not a majority vote, but a consensus. So you have 50 people arguing for different people. And so you can imagine that under those circumstances, it's completely random as to who wins, okay? And, the, and therefore there's no, pre, pre, no, you can't predict what's gonna happen. But, it, uh, but once they reach a consensus, then they are allowed out and then they announce the prize. Uh, everywhere there's flowers, where are the flowers coming from? Italy. And here is the king and queen and uh, prince, the next queen, princess. Uh, uh, and the, the ceremony is moving because they, they've been doing it for over a hundred years. So it's very smooth. Uh, and however, it's very simple. All you have to do is look at the king and do whatever he does. If he stands up, you stand up. If he sits down, you sit down and continue. Okay. And here is receiving the prize from the king. Uh, <clears throat> And then here's a small intimate dinner afterwards. This is about 5,000 uh, people, uh, and it's all synchronized. I mean, it's, and they practice and so on. This is the next uh, uh, queen, uh, and then uh, the, uh, the recipient of the prize in physics was next on the other side of her. 
and they're uh, dancing and they're singing and they're all the ceremony throughout the dinner. And they also, for example, here is, uh, they're coming down with uh, a particular dinner, okay? And they have flares and all the dishes are, have these fountains of flares shooting off and they change colors. And as they march down the stairs and then they reach to your plate and then it turns red and then they deposit the plate. So, and every person is getting a plate, okay? So it's, you know, it's, uh, it's all worked out like a dance. And then finally, I should point out that it's a 12 day ceremony and every minute is taken care of, starting at around 6.30 in the morning and going to bed about three o'clock in the morning. Okay, every day for 12 days. So it is exhausting. And the reason it takes so long in the evening is that every night you have a dance and everybody insists you have 50 people you have to dance with. <laughs> so you crawl into bed and then 6 30 you rise and up you go again. And the next day is, but it's beautiful and it is memorable. Uh, and then there are always things that you never anticipate. Uh, and this one's one for me, and that is this woman uh, in the picture uh, was reading the newspaper and sees a person by the name of Mario Capecchi winning the Nobel Prize, and she knew that name. And what she knew was that Mario Capecchi was her half-brother. She thought we had long died, uh, my mother in a concentration camp, and I just in the streets. And then all of a sudden, Many years later, she sees, hears that we're alive. And so she talks to some newspaper people and they arrange for us to meet. So this is the first, I had no idea that she existed. And there I, we meet and it's obviously she's my sister because you know, the poor woman looks like me. And uh, you know, so you get a chance essentially of seeing things and experiencing things that were uh, unimaginable. And she was a good sister as she should be. Thank you. And I'm happy to answer any questions about anything. Well, thank you very much, Mario, for the inspiring talk. And uh, we'll have now a few questions uh, from the audience. Um, so first of all, how does your life experience inspire and impact your research and professional life? Uh, well, I think uh, good and bad. <laughs> The, the good is that it opens a lot of doors. And for example, I'm very interested in, in the education of younger people, particularly in the grade schools. Uh, and so I, now I have that opportunity. If I a volunteer, people take, it, take me up on it. And so I have a direct communication with kids. And I think that's where you have to maintain curiosity. I mean, a child is born curious. They're always asking you why, 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 until you almost go insane. But uh, then they start losing that curiosity, and that's what we have to maintain. And I think we're pretty good. I think we're many, better than many countries where they almost the schooling is too much at an early stage, so that by the time they get to college, they're exhausted. 
<laughs> so I think uh, we have to always have a balance. And I think in our case, uh, in the United States, I think a lot of the education process starts in college. And, you know, they get a basics in, uh, before that, grades 1 through 12. But it's, it's not very challenging. But then after that, we get educated. The advantage of that is they're still curious. And they're willing to confront us. The way I know my students are ready to leave me is when they are confronting me. <laughs> and that's good. Okay? They ask questions. They demand uh, answers and so on. And that's good. So I think it, it provides uh, lots of opportunities. The negative part is that, for example, if a donor comes to the university, uh, you know, obviously I have to talk with them. <laughs> so, uh, so I think it occupies a lot of your time in things that you not necessarily have a, you know, a great devotion for. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, I have a related question also coming. So given that uh, there is a politicization of science and potential distrust, what would be the responsibility and the best way for scientists to engage in uh, public discourse? I think, the, I mean, first of all, get involved. I mean, I think often we're happy at our lab bench and then we actually, you know, I always think of, I tell my students that if I was really good at communicating, I would have become a lawyer. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so we select for a group of people that aren't very easily communicate with other people, but we have to force ourselves. We have to become our own spokesman. And if they don't understand why science is in, isn't important, it's partly our fault. We have to communicate that enthusiasm and importance and relevance to them. Uh, and I think that's our duty. And the more we do of that, the better, because it, it we're essentially serving our own interests. We have to maintain the public interest if they're providing the funds for doing our research. And so we have to maintain and engage them. And I think, uh, and I think you always, I mean, the easiest thing to do is simply lose the jargon. Science is actually not that complicated. What we do is not that complicated. We code it in a language so that only we can understand it. But if we drop that jargon, then I think it's actually quite easy to communicate. And particularly the relevance of what you're doing is becomes uh, uh, you know, understandable for them, no matter what their education level. Well, it's kind of humbling to hear from a Nobel Prize that what it does is not very complicated, <laughs> but some <laughs> people may disagree. So uh, people ask, uh, how do you know you found a problem where you really want to stake and kind of risk uh, your career, even against the advice of a funding agency? It's kind of how is important? What is the potential for success? Your well, level of confidence? What, how you decide that? I think one measure, which I don't know, I still don't know how to uh, give this to another person, and that is self-confidence. You have to, do, in, particularly in science, because the experiments don't work every time. And so you have to ride through those and know that if you do enough controls, you'll understand why it didn't work, and thereby you improve it. Okay, so you have to have confidence. And, uh, you know, and, and this particular problem was, uh, was you know dramatic in the sense of saying you know that's impossible and then, then and you confront them you say that's a challenge i mean i was brought up on a mantra which said the difficult we do right away the impossible takes a little longer i heard that every day <laughs> so i believe that we can do the impossible we just have to uh, uh have the faith that we can do it and sometimes you're lucky i mean one aspect about science is you know, when you hear about Nobel Prizes, you, you're looking at all the things that worked. There are many p times that people go through, uh, you know, a dream and they can't reach it, but you never hear about them. Okay, you only hear about the successes. So it's a limited pool. But nonetheless, you have to have the, uh, the self-confidence that you can make it. And I think we usually underestimate ourselves rather than overestimate ourselves. And certainly in terms of our brain, I mean, we usually, you know, in a lifetime, we use about 5% of it. Okay, we still have 95% to left over when we're ready to quit. So I think uh, don't underestimate yourself uh, and go for something. 
And my feeling is if you're really passionate about it, you'll do a good job. If you're not passionate about it, you're not going to do a good job. So pick on, work on things that you're passionate about. Work on those things that you think about all the time. Okay, those are the things that you're passionate about. So I think, you know, you have to write, have the right wedding, essentially. You know, one reason I came to Utah is that I couldn't do long-term experiments at Harvard. You know, everything is short-term. Everything's gratification. Boom, boom, boom. And, uh, you know, gene targeting, I mean, I went over in a couple minutes, but it took 10 years okay, to develop. And so I had to have the uh, time and uh, and uh, dedication to be able to go the long distance to do something that's uh, you know worthwhile because most things aren't going to be just an overnight experiment. It it takes a lot of work, and you have to combine it with. Uh, but at the same time, you have to have the hoops to say I can do it and I will do it and uh, and it will be successful. Well, thank you very much. I guess for the audience, you heard it from Mario. If you want to go, do good science, come to Utah. It's the best <laughs> environment. Uh, so I mo one more question uh, related to kind of more to our community. Uh, so as uh, kind of data and large amount of data become more and more important, uh, how can we best educate uh, uh, scientists that work in, in uh, wet labs into data uh, literacy, data visualization, as it relates to science. No, I just recently went to uh, Washington, uh, state of Washington, and visit their uh, genetics department. Okay, I would guess ninety percent of their students are coming from computer science. Okay. Mm -hmm. and then and then they'll learn the biology. I mean. It, you have to be able to handle large data sets. I mean, there's, there's no way of doing biology now without that. Uh, and every experiment you look at is gonna have enormous data sets that you have to, you know, the problem with large data sets, you know, everything's there, but you have to salvage what's important out of that and put it into a form that we can understand and we can communicate. Uh, so I think it takes a skill to then distill things from the, uh, that are useful from large data sets. And I think you have to have that. And so, you know, get all the computer skills you can get because you'll, ne you'll need it. <laughs> and you'll, you'll need, need even more ne next year than you do last year. I mean, you know the, how it quickly, uh, you know, the computer industries, the, the ability to handle information is just going up and up and up. Okay, and we're and you so that's going to keep going, and you have to take advantage of that uh, because I think we will be, you know, biology. You know, the, the what I find fascinating about biology is that it's not logical. Okay? We'd love to be, be have things be logical, but she, Mother Nature, doesn't care about logic. What she cares is that it works, and if it works, she utilizes it, and that is it's selective. There's a selective advantage to it. Uh, and if it doesn't work, it's dropped, okay? And that may not necessarily be logical, but it, nonetheless, it's what we want to identify, that is exactly how is she doing things as opposed to how we would do with the things. Uh, and I think that's also a skill that is, needs to be developed and that you're gonna have to squeeze out of large data sets. Okay, and I guess one last question uh, before we are at the hour. And uh, uh, what can you share at the level that our community can connect to in terms of the next big challenge that you're interested in? Sure. I mean, what we're interested in right now is what happens after COVID, <laughs> okay? We're assuming there is gonna be an end and I think it will come fairly soon. It's just dependent and it may require a vaccine. It may not, but uh, I would guess it will require a vaccine. And so that's going to take a while to disseminate. And, you know, once you have it, it'll take you about half a year to make enough for everybody and then another quarter of a year to disseminate it. Uh, so it's, it's not going to be a quick process. But what's clear is that, uh, that the aftermath of COVID is also going to be enormous. And that is one of the things that every person uh, is liable for is anxiety. 
And what we can see is with COVID, levels of anxiety just rising worldwide, not just us, but worldwide, okay? And anxiety is an important thing in small doses and very detrimental in large doses. That is chronic anxiety leads to depression, leads to OCD, uh, and, and those are the things, the questions we're interested in. What are the consequences of chronic anxiety? What are the mechanisms of being able to regulate it uh, in a, a effective way so that you can manage it as opposed to taking over uh, and then leading to other uh, diseases which are even worse and specifically uh, <clears throat> major depression. 80% uh, of people with, uh, uh, with major depression had chronic anxiety first. So it's a huge comorbidity. The, the two are linked together. And the same thing with this OCD, with schizophrenia, you name it. Uh, and so what we're interested in is what are those mechanisms and how can we manage it? Uh, and so that's what's occupying my time. Uh, and I think it's, uh, it's a fascinating problem, but it's also a very big problem. Uh, you know, it's, uh, and the other thing is that there's a, a lot of sex uh, variation on that. It turns out that chronic anxiety is much more uh, prevalent in women than it is in men. Uh, and, and likewise with uh, major depression and so on as a consequence. So there's uh, you know, lots of parameters that we have to understand. Uh, you first have to under understand the pathology, then you can make rational uh, dis decisions of what to do. And neuro uh, neuropsychiatric disorders are in bad state in the sense that most uh, medicines are there to quiet you down, to just settle you down as opposed to really solving the problem. Uh, and so we have to understand the process, we have to understand how our mind works to then be able to understand why it doesn't work. Okay, well, thank you very much. Uh, this was really an incredible talk uh, with this amazing professional and personal journey. And thanks for sharing your thoughts, including the last part that is really relevant for how things are working now. And uh, we're now moving on with the program with the IEEE Visualization Conference in 2020. Thanks again, Mario. And we'll reconvene uh, uh, in half an hour, 11.30 uh, our time uh, for the beginning of the actual paper presentation. Thanks, Mario. Thank you. Bye. Ciao. Bye-bye. <laughs> Ciao. Pixel Clipper allows visitors to quickly and expressively extract visual clippings from visualizations and add comments to them. The clippings are useful for engaging the public with complex data sets because they are entry points into the visualization. This can be applied in a wide range of engagement experiences, such as the use of facilitated and ambient displays at public engagement events. Progressive visual analytics provides intermediate results in the middle of computation to address a long computational delay. However, such intermediate results are uncertain, so findings from these results can turn out to be incorrect for the entire data. In progressive visual analytics with safeguards, 
we suggest to risk the uncertainty, but we allow humans to leave safeguards every time they risk the uncertainty. Information about vulnerabilities helps defenders prioritize what they need to patch, but this information can be difficult to interpret. In this paper, we support interpretability using a focus and context approach to visualizing vulnerability data, including a clustering overview, plots that enable filtering based on severity, and explanations of text features and descriptions. We invite you to read our paper to learn more. Tableau helps you see the stories in your data. It's designed to help you be smarter, so you can make better decisions faster. Connect to the data you care about. Sort, highlight, drill down, or filter your data in seconds. Add calculations to extend your data. With Tableau, you can keep on asking questions in the data until you discover the root cause. Tableau, answer questions at the speed of thought. Tableau helps you see the stories in your data. It's designed to help you be smarter, so you can make better decisions faster. Connect to the data you care about. Sort, highlight, drill down, or filter your data in seconds. Add calculations to extend your data. With Tableau, you can keep on asking questions in the data until you discover the root cause. Tableau, answer questions at the speed of thought. All of these distribution samples refer to the test samples not well covered by the training data, like these black cats. They are misclassified with high confidence due to their black bodies. To explain why these samples are out of distribution, we developed OD Analyzer, a visual analytics tool which provides an ensemble detection method and a grid-based visualization to detect and analyze out of distribution samples. Suppose you want to see the overall coming structure of a new project repository. Using git class tools, GitHub network, or git log command, it's quite burdensome to get overview and navigate data. We presented Gizru as an interactive visual analytics distance for the git metadata to help users explore and understand the context of development history. Several recent studies advocated the use of non-parametric density models for the improved characterization of data uncertainty. The non-parametric models, however, present the challenges such as increased memory and computational requirements. In this work, we propose an efficient non-parametric framework for volume rendering in the context of uncertain data and show their effectiveness in classifications via comparisons with the other statistical models. Asteroids have always been and will always be a threat to life on Earth. Most likely, an asteroid will hit deep water, but what properties will actually lead to a threat like a tsunami? Ensemble simulations are a common tool to understand the effect of different parameters like the size of the asteroid. We propose an interactive visual approach to help analyzing deep water asteroid impact simulation ensembles. Digital humanities present great opportunities for testing new visualization approaches and evaluation techniques. However, and given the diffuse character and novelty of the field, it may also be intimidating for novel and senior researchers willing to get started in the discipline. In this paper, we propose a data-driven analysis of visualization for the digital humanities to identify key themes, authors, and relevant publications. So if you want to know more, please read our paper. In this presentation, we introduce a provenance library, Track, which makes implementing provenance in web-based tools easy. Track introduces a novel storage model for web-based provenance tracking and has an associated history visualization, which can be fully customized. Track also contains multiple ways to save and share individual states or entire sessions of an application and ensures that export data is easy to analyze in interesting and unique ways.
Billions of biologging records reflect animal behaviors on many temporal spatial scales. Yet, segmenting the time series on multiple scales is often avoided or impeded. Hence, we present our Multisec VA platform with its three contributions. First, Multisec VA contributes tailored visual interactive features for multi scale segmentation. Second, we show a new visual query language to flexibly configure scale wise techniques and parameters. This VQL consumes a domain oriented set of techniques, our third contribution. White space surfaces are a novel approach to convey depth in vessel visualizations. The core idea is to shift all additional depth cues away from geometry and to use the usually empty space between the vascular structures. This allows us to display functional parameters on the surface and supporting cues on the background. We will explain how to generate such surfaces and how to use them as a canvas to further enhance depth and shape perception. How many clusters can you see in these images? With different visual recordings and scatter plots, our perception of cluster count changes. We developed models that consider how visual density influences cluster perception. Further, we demonstrate using a threshold plot to optimize the saliency of clusters. As commonly known, dimensional interreduction techniques and their interpretations are complex, biased and uncertain. In drug design, this highly complicates the search for similar and new chemical compounds. To overcome this issue, Canva brings comparison of different molecular descriptors and properties into one tool, featuring planar, 3D and table views for evaluating the trustworthiness of high dimensional data projection. The ever-evolving landscape of malware detection and invasion creates a constant catch-up contest between the defenders and the adversaries. We created a system which submits and analyzes a malware sample with Cuckoo Sandbox and then animates the battle between the malware and the anti-malware system. The Gotta Evade All system is a useful tool that uses a familiar concept based on Pokemon, allowing the understanding of malware evasive behavior to be more accessible. We propose X-Matrix, a novel method for random forest interpretability. From a random forest model, a logic rule is extracted from each decision path on every decision tree. Once the complete set of logic rules is obtained, visual representations can be built for global and local explanations. X-Matrix, making random forests interpretable. Programmers often make mistakes like this. ABS function is incorrectly called with a string. A programming language can catch such mistakes early on, but for this, it needs a type system. We present Typical, an interactive visualization tool for programming language designers. Typical allows them to explore common function type signatures and helps create a type system. A dynamic graph models changing relationships between entities over time. In this work, we present multi scale snapshots, a vision analytics approach to provide an overview of a dynamic graph at multiple temporal scales. The approach consists of three steps creating multi scale temporal summaries, applying graph embeddings, and the semi automatic visual analysis. The combination of these steps lets us visually explore how temporal and structural properties affect the overall dynamic graph. Linking and brushing is very useful for interactive visual data exploration. Data-driven brushing tools are getting popular recently and achieve good results, for example the Mahanodobis brush and the CN-based brush. However, these brushing tools are optimized by the data from a large number of users, which are not suitable for everyone. In this paper, we introduce an adaptive brush model which takes the user in a loop to improve the brush accuracy. VisaVis is a visual support system for the development of visualization algorithms. It has live compilation, automatic version control, predefined interactions, and tools for visual parameter analysis. By displaying the complete history of the algorithm, users get insights into the correlation between source code changes and visual differences.
we propose an interactive ensemble analysis framework that provides flexible interactive exploration of the ensemble data. Time series characteristics of data can be obtained by fast browsing time steps. The region stability heat map view shows the stability of the selected region and provides region adjustment by directly clicking. Program developers spend significant time on optimizing and tuning applications. But working with binary code to understand what compiler optimizations were applied can be challenging. We present our visual analytics system, CCNAP, designed to identify and assess compiler optimizations in binary code. Check out our paper to learn more. In our paper, we address the problem of navigating complex multiscale and dense environments, such as these molecular models. We present a technique for browsing a model by clicking on textual labels, which we call hyperlabels. This allows the user to intuitively navigate the hierarchical organization of the model. For more details, read our paper or watch the talk. SPA SDC is a visualization system that helps researchers understand the resiliency of HPC computation kernels to silent error corruptions. It gives users multiple perspectives of details with different granularity about the impact of SDC on an application's output. It also provides novel insight into how silent error propagates through a program's execution. Predictions made by machine learning models can be hard to understand. Counterfactual explanations explain model predictions by telling the users how to obtain the desired prediction with minimal changes to the input. We introduce DEES, an interactive visualization system that supports counterfactual-based explorations on individual instances and data subgroups. Please check our paper for more details. Interacting with large datasets could be painfully slow. We can reduce the latency with faster backends, but that's not always attainable. Here, we investigate a solution that only leverages techniques on the front ends. We propose interaction snapshots, where users can view the results at a later time. We found that users experienced much less frustration and were able to complete the tasks faster. Thank you.
ecosystems are complex and dynamic. To investigate the dynamic nature of ecosystems, we have developed a prototype of a visual analytics system based on empirical dynamic modeling, EDM. EDM is a set of analytical methods rooted in nonlinear state space reconstruction. Integrating EDM with dimensionality reduction, brush linked visualizations, and visual summarization support understandings of ecosystem dynamics. Ray tracing techniques can create images of astonishing realism and beauty. In the last years, the performance of those techniques has been increased significantly using dedicated hardware. Who thought that it's also possible to accelerate this? We show how to dramatically accelerate force-directed graph drawing with RT cores, yielding a speed-up of 4 to 13x. If you want to know more, please see our talk. After determining the departure timestamp, the experts then moved to verify the recommended shuttle stops and routes. Note that ShuttleFizz recommends the default shuttle stops and routes based on the metric of average distance. Then they observed that in our cluster 4, the system recommends Hezhen Genyuan as the shuttle bus stop but the experts identified that another drop-off spot Pan Shan Huiyuan is located in the middle part in this regional cluster.